Okay, we will uh, call to order the public hearing. We will call to order the public hearing schedule for 545 for the purpose of soliciting public input with respect to a real estate contract for the purchase of properties at 13 Wolcott Street, Sacred Heart Church Building, Rectory Building, School Building, and Convent Building. Uh, if you wish to speak on this topic, I ask that you please sign up with our City Sheriff Steve Conway. Uh, please state your name and address for the record. You'll have a five minute time limit and I will give you a one minute heads up. Mr. Conway. Okay, first uh, speaker tonight from, from 97 Idlewood Avenue, Gerard Ard Ardeff. And another one from 97 Idlewood is Sarah Ardeff, Ardeff A. A C H R A F. Okay, next speaker is twenty six Seymour Street, Efren Gonzalez. Okay, next speaker from 430 Frost Road, Norman Lambert. Good evening. Thank you once again for allowing me to speak to you this evening. My name is Norman Lambert. I'm a longtime parishioner of the Shrine of St. Anne and now All Saints. I am a member of its parish council as well as the president of the Holy Name Society. I am also a resident of Waterbury. I am here to speak in favor of the purchase of Sacred Heart Campus by the city of Waterbury. I do so for several reasons. The plan for the property as envisioned and presented by the mayor is comprehensive. The purchase of the campus addresses issues facing our city in a positive, compassionate way. The purchase and subsequent work would help to transform and reinvigorate the neighborhood. The price of the purchase is a very reasonable one, especially in light of its evaluation. The campus would benefit the city and its residents now and in the future. In conclusion, I ask please don't hide behind legal arguments about what is and is not allowable. Please do not make this purchase political or one that pits us against them. Please do not hesitate to reach out to the hungry, the homeless, the imprisoned, out of fear. Instead, please vote in favor of this purchase. Thank you and God bless. Next speaker from 11 Steuben Street, Lawrence V. DePillo. Good evening, Lawrence DiPillo, 11 Steuben Street. The mayor, Hugh Alderman, and other elected and appointed commissions serve a single purpose, to protect and enhance the lives and livelihoods of the citizen of Waterbury. Anything less amounts to a dereliction of duty, which is why we hold elections. This evening, your vote is sought to purchase the former Sacred Heart Church Rectory School and Convent located at 13 Wilkett Street from the All Saints Parish Corporation for $950,000. According to Saturday's Republican American newspaper, the mayor said there was no official inspection report on the buildings. He said the WDC conducted an informal analysis of the school, finding it would cost approximately $1 million to rehab. No rehab cost for the church, rectory, or convent. He said finding for the repairs would come, funding for the repairs would come from a number of sources, including the city's ARPA funding, a regional development board, and students rehabilitating the building. He didn't think it's going to be a massive burden on the taxpayers and acknowledged he did not know precisely every pot of money that would be used for the project. 
Our remaining $4 million share of the ARPA American Rescue Plan funds were to be allocated for desperately needed infrastructure repairs, such as our roads and sidewalks, and to reduce the burden on us taxpayers, not to purchase and rehabilitate a church, rectory, school, and convent. Also, with a 50% second phase in on the assessment due July 1st, and potentially another tax increase looming, why are ARPA funds and tax dollars being spent on an underwater real estate deal, admittedly going to burden the taxpayers? The reason is because our current zoning laws only allow for halfway residences to be located in the industrial general IG zone. And the two and a half acres of land that houses the Sacred Heart buildings are in a residential zone. The mayor and his administration are proposing to purchase the property in the name of the city to frustrate our zoning laws that protect the neighborhoods. By claiming the city is exempt from zoning and his administration can do whatever they please with the property once they own it. The proposed purchase of 13 Wilker Street would include a continued lease of the convent building to Connecticut Renaissance and to facilitate the subdivision of the land both for the convent and rectory buildings. Residents located at 24 Central Avenue, a rooming house owned and operated by Connecticut Renaissance, would be relocated to the former rectory building. The women currently occupying the convent, 64 beds, and the men being relocated to the rectory, 45 beds, are according to the State of Connecticut Department of Correction, offenders ages 18 and over, and offenders serving a sentence for or having been convicted of arson or sexual assault will be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. In September 2013, the City Plan Commission approved the modification of permitted uses to restrict halfway residences to the IG district and to modify the definition to a facility for housing of persons placed at the direction or under the custody and control of the Department of Corrections pro prohibition or parole. That October, the Zoning Commission approved the recommendation and finds that Waterbury has an over-concentration of halfway residents and finds there is a need to protect neighborhoods from an over-concentration of halfway residents and finds the City Plan Commission recommended approval. Furthermore, the purpose provides standards for the use of the property for halfway residents to ensure compatibility of such use with the neighborhoods and surrounding properties to protect public health and safety and convenience. The total number of sleeping rooms or a halfway resident occupants shall not exceed six on any lot and shall not exceed two per bedroom. The convent on Wilker Street boasts 64 beds and 24 Central Avenue 45 beds, a potential for 109 State of Connecticut Department of Correction offenders. One minute. Should you pass this ill-advised proposal for the city to purchase 13 Wilkins Street, you do so knowing full well that it's going to be a financial burden on us taxpayers. It's depleting our ARPA funds needed for infrastructure repairs. It's putting our homeowners and residents in the residential neighborhood at risk from an over-concentration of halfway residents and is only being purchased by the city to frustrate our zoning laws that only allow for halfway residences in an industrial IG zone. Waterbury is known as a city of neighborhoods. Once the quality of life in the neighborhood deteriorates, those who can't afford to leave Waterbury will. The rest will suffer the consequences of yet another disastrous administration. Thank you. Next speaker from 249 Thomason Avenue, Patrick Donnelly. Good evening, honorable members. Thank you for your time. My name is Patrick Donnelly. I'm representing the Northwest Regional Workforce Investment Board located at 249 Thomaston Avenue. I'm delivering these remarks on behalf of our CEO, Catherine Awad. Thank you for your time and consideration this evening. For decades, the Workforce Board has been diligently collaborating with stakeholders to provide job training and employment opportunities for returning citizens here in Waterbury and the surrounding region. We've recognized the need to support individuals reintegrating into society, whether they're transitioning from halfway houses or returning from incarceration. And we've coordinated numerous programs offering these supports over the last few years. <clears throat> last fall, we, re -inaugurate, we inaugurated the Reentry Welcome Center on Bishop Street, modeled after a successful center in Hartford. This initiative, spearheaded by community partners in action and supported by various agencies, has been instrumental in aiding returning citizens. However, stable housing and employment remain crucial for successful integration. 
The proposed relocation of the second CT Renaissance facility to the Sacred Heart campus offers promising opportunities. By consolidating halfway houses and providing workforce training programs at this location, we can significantly improve outcomes for those in need. This move not only reduces the footprint of halfway houses, but also opens avenues for repurposing existing spaces, potentially addressing the shortage of housing units within the city. Furthermore, the potential establishment of a workforce training center on the campus will only complement the services provided by the Reentry Welcome Center. Collaboration with the Justice Education Center and other entities offering workforce programs demonstrates our commitment to empowering returning citizens. Programs like the Pre-Apprenticeship Carpentry Program can not only prepare individuals for gaining employment, but also contribute to community projects like school facility repairs. The board's existing relationships with the Carpenters Union and other employers will play a crucial role in realizing this vision, and leveraging these partnerships will bolster the success of our efforts in providing meaningful opportunities for returning citizens. That said, integrating various training programs available in the region, such as those at MASC, St. Vincent de Paul, and Naugatuck Valley Community College, will ensure a comprehensive approach to skill development for these individuals. The Workforce Board is steadfast in its commitment to providing training and support services to all residents. This proposed project marks a substantial stride towards improving our capability to fulfill this pledge, and th this proposal has the Board's full support. So thank you for your time. Next speaker from 1062 Meriden Road, Dennis Buckley. Good evening, Mr. President, honorable members of the board, for purposes of your record, Dennis Buckley, 1062 Meriden Road, City of Waterbury. This evening, I will state for the record that through the courtesy of the Corporation Counsel's Office on March 7th, I was given an advanced copy of an opinion which I'm sure has been shared with the members of this particular body. Uh, I choose to exercise, perhaps in an abundance of caution, the rules of professional conduct that are binding upon attorneys, specifically section 4.2 and 4.3, and will not offer any comment this evening or at any point forward with respect to that particular opinion of the subject matter which it covers. Therefore, the balance of my remarks are as a citizen. If this matter goes forward in the regular meeting that shall follow this public hearing, as I suspect it shall, and if, in all likelihood, it enjoys a favorable action on behalf of this body, may I respectfully inquire just as to certain procedural aspects within the Charter that would comply in the implementation of certain requirements under the Charter. The actual substance of this is listed as old business one and two. Number one is the contract. Number two is outlining how monies will be made available to actually appropriate and expend in performance of the contract, if you approve it, to acquire the property. The second old business number two, the contract having been transmitted, being transmitted January 11. Old business number two is specified under a transmittal February 1st from the manager of budget development and oversight. It makes reference to the circumstance of a transfer to go into the capital improvement fund, which was approved in June along with the general fund budget. It makes specific reference to an account number to be lodged within the Department of Finance, 547010 as to be the recipient of the million fifty thousand dollars. That account number doesn't appear in this, doesn't appear in the general fund budget under the Department of Finance as approved in June of 2023. The things that I would ask you to make sure are appropriately complied with if in fact you choose to approve this and appropriate funds. Chapter 3, Board of Aldermen, Section 3A-2, Subsection C, Subdivision 2, found at page 15 of the Charter of the City of Waterbury. Eleven members must approve an affirmative vote to purchase this property. Still within Chapter 3, Section 3B-4, Subsection C, located at page 21 of your Charter. If this has been referred to a committee and favorably reported, and if the finances are available and unencumbered, if you choose to avoid having to defer this in terms of passage until the next regular meeting, 
Again, you must have an affirmative vote of 11 members, and the clerk is to keep a record of that vote. You also will have the circumstance that there's not to be a passage of a resolution requiring the expenditure of any money until the Director of Finance has certified that there is, in fact, money available for the purpose enumerated unencumbered. Going now to what would be Chapter 9, Budget, specifically Part C, Capital Projects. Please look at 9C-1, the Capital Budget, which will make reference to the circumstance that the Board of Aldermen shall have the power to transfer from time to time to the Capital Improvement Fund any portion of the general fund cash surplus not otherwise appropriate. Where is this actually being appropriated from? Is ARP going to reimburse an appropriation that comes from the general fund cash surplus? I leave that to your investigation and determination. <laughs> Lastly, Part D, post-adoption financial provisions, Section D-1, located at page 84, additional appropriations after the passage of the budget in One June of last year. Again, requiring an affirmative vote of 11 We're members. To, to the this. degree that I may have overlooked citing the section of the Charter for 9C-1, that's located at page 83. Remember, the devil is in the details. Please check this and make sure things are in order. Next speaker from 26 Seymour Street, Heffin Gonzalez. Good evening, board members. My name is Ephraim Gonzalez from 26 Seymour Street. I'm here tonight to address this very important uh, agenda that you have you know, proposed for the city of Waterbury concerning Sacred Heart High School. Uh, Mr. Larry DePillo just uh, handed me out a uh, you know, informational piece of paper. I'm quite sure that uh, you already have you know, copies of this. Uh, but what is printed in here is 100% correct. Uh, I also want to add on top of this that uh, I, had, I had about 100 people coming here today. I don't know what happened, but you know how the you know, Hispanic community is, that they're, uh, sometimes they're lax on you know, showing their duties. But I've been a lifelong uh, city resident of the city of Waterbury <laughs> and uh, East Maine. I understand well. Uh, this project that the city has is no good for the city of Waterbury. It's no good for that area over there for the simple reason that if you, if you bring another clinic there, another methadone clinic, what you're doing is you're, you're creating a mess on top of a mess. You know that when these methadone clinics are around the area, it's a perfect hangout. It's a perfect hangout. The police department knows about that too. It's a perfect hangout for drug dealers to go there. The thing is, that's one issue. Issue number two, the uh, depreciation of the houses. I have a lot of family members that have houses in that area there. They're, they're, they're already concerned. They're already concerned. Uh, that's, that's another issue, depreciation. The, Third issue is, who are these people that want to take that, uh, uh, that place? Over here it says the city of Waterbury, but I, I never knew that the city of Waterbury was, uh, was uh, in the process of uh, you know, uh, doing business. The, the city of Waterbury should not be doing business purchasing properties unless it's for the benefits of the taxpayers. This, I don't see no benefits for the, uh, you know, for the taxpayers. Uh, this is, to me, this is just a group of uh, private people that want to buy uh, the whole complex and make some money. That's all. I mean, so I don't, uh, I don't approve of this. I don't approve of this. Now you're saying, well, who you are? You know, only one person against. I'm quite sure that once this gets hitting the newspaper again, a lot of people are going to attend more, you know, more on, on, on uh, this, you know, type of situation. Uh, like I said, it, it's, it's just a bad, a bad deal for the city of Waterbury, for the citizens of East Main there. Uh, it's just a bad deal. So I, I urge all you people here, all the uh, Board of Aldermen, 
to reconsider this and you know make it a good effort and and go back to the go back to the drawing table again and say talk to these people say listen we got heavy opposition against this uh, there's a there's a phrase over here about w, uh, WDA. I, I was a member of WDA, so I know how these people operate. I know how these people operate. They, when they want to buy something, they paint it nice and rosy, and then when they take over, it's a big mess. It's a big mess. I don't approve it, and that's it. Thank you very much. Next speaker from 174 Cortland Avenue, Ken Goya. How are you doing tonight? Um, Ken Goya, 174 Cortland Avenue. Um, I'm a notorious a short speaker, so um, this will be quick. A um, couple words on the, on the Sacred Heart uh, property uh, being a proposal to acquire it for the city of Waterbury. So I understand uh, Waterbury's property taxes, some of the highest in the state, not the fault of this or, or the previous administration. We understand that. But that doesn't mean we don't need to practice good fiscal stewardship with the resources we do have. So I know a lot of people have a lot of ideas for this property, homeless shelters, uh, food banks, uh, halfway houses, uh, whatever. Um, th there's, there's a lot of things that the Waterbury City Government does really well. I don't think the acquisition and development of property is in our wheelhouse. Um, let's leave that to the, to the uh, commercial professionals that would, would take that risk on. We, there's a lot of unknowns with this property, as, as one of the previous speakers had mentioned. Um, so so let, let a commercial professional take that risk, not the Waterbury taxpayers. If it turns out to be a white elephant, then that shouldn't and wouldn't be our problem. That is, would be up to a developer. So uh, let's show the Waterbury taxpayers that the municipal government won't play fast and loose with their hard earned money. This is something that we really don't, really don't need. Be nice to have, we don't really need it. Thanks for letting me share. Next speaker from 413 Harpers Ferry Raw, Paul Condash. Good evening, Mr. President, members of the board. My name is Paul Condash. I reside at 413 Harpers Ferry Road. This board has the power to do something that most people never get a chance to do in their lifetimes. And that is the power to give those less fortunate than us hope, real hope. You have the power to change their lot in life with this purchase and this plan. Did you know that for most of his life, Abraham Lincoln was considered poor and a failure? When he ran for president in 1860, he didn't even hold public office and had been defeated in the 1858 senatorial election. In his political career, he lost seven elections, but the one thing he never lost was his hope. And he arguably went on to become the greatest president this country has ever had. Maybe, just maybe, and those who will help with this purchase and this plan will be another Abraham Lincoln. The city most certainly will be looking to purchase additional properties in the future and those without a plan might be the one that this board wants to draw a line in the sand on. This purchase is not the one to draw the line in the sand on. Questions have been asked and answered to the best of everyone's ability. The walkthrough has been completed and legal concerns addressed. It's time for a vote. It's time to vote to purchase this property. This purchase will be made by this board by a majority vote. The rule of law will have been satisfied. Democracy will have taken place in this chamber. There are needy men, women, and children in this city, and this purchase will be the start of a plan to help the needy. In addition, 
this purchase and plan will be the start of a much larger humanitarian project. The debate is over. It's time for a vote. It's time to approve this purchase. Thank you. Next speaker from 276 Jersey Street, Sharon Natale. for giving me another opportunity to speak. Sharon Natale, 276 Jersey Street, Waterbury, Connecticut. I read in the newspaper that a lot of questions are still being asked about the purchase. Even members of the board have questions. Why do the members of the board have questions? I wanted to know what you told the neighbors that live in the neighborhood. What did you tell them? Were they notified? I know you can't answer me. We went through that last time. But I really want to know, were the neighbors notified? If it was coming in my neighborhood, like. I'd like to be notified up front. You can't pick it up. It sounds like uh, there's a rush with this project. I realize the money has to be spent by a certain time. Can you just take a little more time to think about the project? I don't think we're ready to make the purchase. Thank you. Next speaker from 24 Central Avenue, Kathleen DeShanes. Good evening, President and members of the Aldermen. My name is Kathleen DeShane, and I'm the CEO for Connecticut Renaissance. We're a nonprofit human service organization that was founded in 1967. We've operated a work release program, some call it a halfway house, um, at the church property in the former convent for 40 years. Um, we serve 64 men, so I think it was stated in the paper it's women, but we have 64 men there who are returning to the community from incarceration. Uh, we also operate a program similar at 24 Central Avenue, and this is for 45 men. Uh, we've been uh, talking with the Archdiocese for a number of years, for about six years now, about purchasing the property. Um, but because it's one entire lot, it would need to be subdivided in order for it to be purchased. So I started talking with uh, Mayor O'Leary a couple of years ago about wanting to purchase this property. Um, and specifically being interested in the convent and then ultimately looking to move our 24 Central Avenue program over to the rectory so that these two programs could be right next to each other and afford us the opportunity to share some staff. Also one program cooks for the other so it would be more convenient for us to be able to deliver meals. Um, these are men that are returning to their community. Waterbury is their choice of place to come home. Um, and what they get is case management services. Uh, they have a job developer. We work with the uh, Northwest Regional uh, Workforce Development Board to help the guys to get training so that they could get jobs that are leading to careers uh, as opposed to you know, just going out and working at um, a fast food or a, you know, a position that might end up landing them back into uh, prison. So working and having that program on site as well, we'll be able to work seam seamlessly together on the same property um, to ensure that they receive job development services and then ultimately become taxpaying citizens of Waterbury. Uh, we do not operate a methadone clinic. I just want to be clear about that. Uh, we have a behavioral health clinic further up the road. We don't uh, have any methadone services in Connecticut Renaissance, but many of the men that we serve receive um, clinical services is there where they see a therapist, um, a, a prescriber if they need medication, um, and also intensive outpatient services. So we do have an array of services under one roof. Um, just wanted to provide some clarification about why we're interested in bringing these two programs together. We're not adding any more beds to the community. We're just consolidating on one lot. So we'd like to move from 24 Central uh, to the rectory. Thank you. Next speaker from 185 Herschel Avenue, Mario Fusco Jr. Good evening, thank you for giving me a chance to speak. 
Um, I don't have anything prepared, but I'd like to speak from a little bit of experience. I live at 185 Herschel Avenue in Waterbury. My family owns a business on 1215 Thomaston Avenue in Waterbury. Excuse me one second, just uh, your name, I apologize. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Mario Fusco okay. Jr. Um, I am a returning citizen. Uh, at one time I was. And when I returned to Waterbury, I was put in touch with a group of people called the Greater Waterbury Reentry Council. Um, they embraced me there and I became a member of the Greater Waterbury Reentry Council. The council put together a plan, um, hundreds of people, um, service providers all over the city and state. Uh, we talked about bringing a reentry welcome center to the city of Waterbury. And for four years, we developed a plan to do that. I helped write the implementation plan, um, and I attended all the uh, meetings and the developmental phases. I can speak from experience that I have seen personally lives change because of the services that are offered at the Reentry Welcome Center on Bishop Street. I've seen it, and I'm one of them. That's why I've stayed a member of the council um, going into my fifth year right now. The next stage, as we were developing the program, which has now serviced dozens and dozens and dozens of returning uh, citizens and connected them with resources that they need to make sure that they don't reoffend, the next step was to develop education and training um, so that they had avenues other than the ones that got them into trouble in the first place. When I read the article about the plan for the development of Sacred Heart, I knew that that is exactly what the council was trying to build. The city of Waterbury helped develop and renovate the building on Bishop Street that now houses the Reentry Welcome Center. So I know that the administration here at Waterbury is capable of taking a property that may be derelict and turning it into something that is useful. When I mean, when I, what I mean by useful is that that particular property is serving the city of Waterbury by providing services to those who don't know how to access services otherwise and by providing those services and connecting them with the people that they need to be connected with in order to contribute to society, you are developing more workforce, more positive contributors, and you are reducing the likelihood that more crimes will be committed. So I'm in favor of this, this project, because firsthand I know that the dividends that it can pay to the city of Waterbury are far beyond the costs involved in executing the plan. Thank you for your time. Next speaker from 286 Fieldwood Road, Michael Savalino. <laughs> Afternoon, Michael Cervellino, 286 Fieldwood Road, Waterbury, Connecticut. I've been here 35, 36 years on Fieldwood Road. I also, for the last 15 years, owned Bell Academy of Cosmetology, a cosmetology, barbering, nail, and eyelash school. And I've been there about 15 and a half years. Love it. I take in some of the city students. We do tours. We do special ed stuff. And I have a lot of the graduates from the high schools in the city and the surrounding towns that attend my school. And I'm happy to do business in the city of Waterbury. My problem is, is that Larry had read a great letter. And I like that letter. I do not want my tax dollars. And I just cut my checks to the federal government and to the state. And I got a new one coming to the city. And I pay an awful lot of taxes in the city between my business and my vehicles and my home. I do not want my tax dollars going to this project. And I'm going to tell you why. Renaissance House, number one. I've had not one, but two gentlemen enroll since September. Started the program, went very good. And all of a sudden, we had a relapse with one man. And he's gone. He's back at Carl Robinson in Enfield. He's back in jail. Okay? I am trying to do the best thing for the city. I'm taking in 
guys that have come out of jail or that have come through programs or that are currently in a halfway house like Renaissance. I got another gentleman that enrolled, started, came two days, he's gone. Don't know where he is. I keep checking the, um, the list, um, the state government list, judicial, to see if he's in jail. Don't know where he is. We are two for two with this program, and I'm trying to get guys' jobs and turn them around. I don't know the stats on guys that come out or people that come out and go to other halfway houses and go back out, like the gentleman just said, that it turns lives around. I'm trying to turn lives around. I'll take more, but it's going to mess up my financial aid. Okay? I can't give Pell Grants and student loans for people that just take off or mess up and go back in jail again. Okay? So I do not want my tax dollars going to this project because I know that it's not working. And it's, I'm living proof I'm two for two right now. I don't know anybody else's numbers, but I know what I have. And it's just recently that these guys enrolled in September and October. Thank you. Mr. President, that's the last speaker for the Sacred Heart public hearing. Okay, with that, we will close the public hearing and we will call to order the regular meeting of the Board of Aldermen for Monday, March 11th, 2024. If everybody could please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and a silent prayer. Alderman Alsup. Present. Alderwoman Cavallo. Present. Alderman Dorso. Here. Alderman Hunter. Here. Alderman Lopez. Here. Alderman Mosley. Here. Alderwoman Martinez McCarthy. Here. Alderman Rinaldi. Here. Alderman Nujame. Present. Alderman Rodriguez. Present. Alderman Taljadine. Present. Alderman Salvio. Present. Alderwoman Weaver. Here. Alderman Zimmerman. Present. Alderwoman, I'm sorry. And Alderman D.G. Ovin Carlo. Here. We have 15 present. Okay, we have a quorum. Um, before we start with the public hearing, I uh, uh, just want to inform you that Mayor uh, Pernaruski uh, is sick. Uh, he was not able to come into work all day today. He did postpone a vacation to go see his grandson down south to ensure that he was here for this meeting, but unfortunately uh, he fell ill, so he will not uh, be here tonight. Uh, and with that, we will um, have, uh, start, our public here, uh, start our public speaking. Uh, if you wish to address the board on any matter, please sign up with our city sheriff, uh, Steve Conway. Uh, please state your name and address for the record. Uh, you'll have a five-minute time limit, uh, and I will give you a one-minute warning. Mr. Conway. First speaker tonight from 83 Anderson Avenue, Alphonse Avitelio. I, uh, before I start, I need clarification. I own property on 83 Anderson Avenue, but I do not live in Waterbury. So does that give me the permission to speak? Yes, sir. That's fine. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Al Avatabale. I used to be a longtime resident of Waterbury and worked at the University of Connecticut Waterbury campus for 30 years. Um, I'm here about uh, the resolution uh, to call for a ceasefire in uh, Gaza. And I'm going to use the editorial in the Waterbury paper uh, to comment from, which was published February 28, 2024. It's, the editorial says, there is no, nothing useful to say about the conflict in the Gaza Strip by this body. It's 5,600 miles 
southwest of the brass city, Waterbury, Connecticut. The distance from the brass city is irrelevant to common humanity. It transcends the distance. And so I find that as a weak argument by the editorial board of the Waterbury paper. Yes, Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th, and that was an improper and inappropriate action by them, and no one, I think, would deny it. But since the killing by Hamas of 1,200 Palest uh, Israelis, the Israeli army has killed 30,000 men, women, and children in Gaza. You see it frequently on the television or every night when our so-called free press attempts to address it. The, the uh, paper also quotes Martha Luther King, uh, the great leader of the civil rights movement, as, su as supporting uh, the state of Israel. That was in 1968. Today, I believe, and I cannot speak for Martha Luther King Jr., that he would be appalled at what the Israeli Defense Force meaning really the Israeli army, has done to the civilians in Gaza, both in the north of Gaza and in the south of Gaza. 30,000 men, women, children, and unborn have been killed by the Israeli army. The euphemism is the Israeli Defense Force. They have invaded the Gaza Strip and done horrendous damage to the innocent Palestinian people living in that strip. And to quote, as I already mentioned, Martin Luther King Jr. as supporting the State of Israel in 1968, I believe truly if he could witness today what the Israeli Defense Force is doing now in the Gaza Strip, he would in no way defend that action. Thank you. Next speaker from 349 Willow Street, Francisco Ramos. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Francisco Ramos. I live at 349 Willow Street, Waterbury, Connecticut. Thank you all for having me here today. As we now start at daylight savings time, hope you all had a good night's sleep this past week, despite the lost hour. So with that being said, we, we all know why we're here this evening on a couple of different issues going on. So for example, going back for, for spend, misspending taxes, not taking care of the public as they should be, and as you guys, regardless of what politician you stand at, whether you're the, uh, whether you're the mayor, alderman, secretary, whatever, you're just supposed to be representing the people. So as a politician, I believe you should put the people first. So for example, so, it, um, so um, taking care of some of these abandoned buildings, the, uh, decreasing the homeless population, stopping all these evictions as inflation keeps going up constantly, uh, that's just on the city and state level. Now going back to the worldwide issue, the main reason why we're here tonight, we need to um, you know, free Palestine and de I demand a permanent ceasefire, because nevertheless, how would you guys feel for your families to be affected, whether it's cousins, nephew, grandchildren, to your own children, whoever, et cetera. You know, it's totally uncalled for. Yes, uh, as, as one of the other speakers stated, Hamas or et cetera might have started it. So I understand, you know, you gotta defend yourself, right? But nevertheless, there should be a limit to how much you should be allowed to do. Because 1,200 compared to 30,000, you know, it's kind of, you know, 
oh, oh, excuse me, overkill to the point where it's like, okay, we get it. How much more damage can we possibly take as to why you're going to keep going and going? You know, enough is enough already. Because not to mention, me now as a taxpayer, I'm currently a substitute for Waterbury. So I feel like some of my tax money is going to this nonsenseless war that's just going to keep happening over and over. And if we keep feeding to the fire, how is it going to put an end to any of this madness? Which is also another cause of inflation as it all connects over and over as time keeps going. So, so that's my main reason for coming out tonight. We need to put a permanent ceasefire to stop from innocent children, innocent civilians being demolished out of nowhere. And then coming back to the city life, we need to be properly spending our tax dollars, you know, renovating some of these abandoned buildings to decrease the homeless population so we can have less people becoming drug addicts, which is also another domino effect to affecting the population. Even got another issue, going back to gun safety, like how a lot of these kids are getting their hands on guns and affecting other children throughout the cities and states. So it's like, how do you expect to be a role model and set an example for other people if you're not even addressing some of the main issues that keep constantly happening over and over? You may not see it every day, every month, but it's out there, and people are even getting their hands on, the wrong people getting their hands on the guns, and they're still shooting other innocent people. As I even watch, whether it's Fox News, CNN, WTNH, Eyewitness News, you name it. The word is out there, and we really need to make sure we start addressing some of these issues that people keep talking about on a constant basis that is never being addressed. So that's my main concern also, on top of the ceasefire. So we really need to start actually taking care of the people that you want to be voted in to represent us, then actually start doing our jobs properly, addressing all these main factors that are not being addressed all the time. Because the more we keep saying every day, it seems like this is becoming the norm over and over, and then even as despite car accidents, how people also keep getting run over and killed, like the 34-year-old the about two, two weeks ago on my block, as people One minute. were running. Thank you, sir. As people always are running streetlights and all that. But, I mean, that's also another issue. But the main, main two things is the safety in our schools for our children and the ceasefire in Palestine. Because if that doesn't stop, who knows where things are going to keep going as we progress this year going to 2025. God bless America. Thank you for your time. Next speaker from 82 Bracken Road in Waterbury. Uh, first name is S U E A D D Yag Yahoo. Thank you for your time, Council Members. My name is Suad Yari. I am from Gaza. I would like to begin by saying Ramadan Mubarak to those celebrating. With that being said, I should be setting up a thought which is Islamic breaking fast feast with my family instead of speaking for the other half of my family who don't have a voice, the ones who are starving, the ones who are picking up flour from the floor and picking through animal feed to even have an iftar. It makes no sense that the situation in Gaza is too complex for a ceasefire because ceasefire is very simple. It means stop firing. It's so simple that it's designed to be heard and understood in the middle of a battle. There's no middle ground when it comes to it. You either follow the order or you don't. Currently, we have a toll, a death toll of 30,000 people, not including bodies that have yet to be dis recovered from under the rubbles. There have been almost 70,000 people who have been injured, some left with life-changing disabilities. According to the Amnesty International, the death rate in Gaza right now is one death every four minutes. It's not just the Israeli bombs that are killing the Palestinian people, it's malnourishment and poor sanitation. We know there are people starving, they are eating animal feed, and grass to feed their hunger. In January, over half of all of the eight deliveries were denied access. It could not give the aid to the people that needed it the most. Less than half of the hospitals that are in Gaza are, are quickly running out of ba basic supplies unless Israel lets aid come through. Since 2008, Israel has refused entry to any UN agency individuals. After all the attempts to hide and shield themselves from any accountability, we know that war crimes are being committed. Refugee camps are being targeted in strikes against churches and schools sheltering hundreds of Palestinians being bombed to the ground. 
Earlier this week, Israel ordered an evacuation of the hospital to turn around and then snipe the people attempting to leave. There are about 2,500 people still trapped in hospitals. Israel's own prime minister of defense, and I quote, a complete siege on Gaza. No electricity, no food, no water, no gas. As the occupying power, Israel has an obligation under the international law to ensure basic needs of Gaza civilians' population. Israel is not doing that. Now the ICJ specifically directed Israel to take immediate and effective measures to enable the provision of humanitarian assistance and basic services. They are not doing that. They also refused to reinstate the water supply that they turned off months ago, stopping medicine and food. Israel's disproportionate and indiscriminate, indiscriminate bombing of civilians combined with everything else that we know is the definition of collective punishment which is illegal under international law. The ending of violence of Gaza rests in the hands of the country's supply of money and the weapons to Israel. The ICJ had found that there is a plausible risk that Israel is committing genocide. It is upon US to say no more. Again, I want to say one death every four minutes. By the time I'm done with my comment, there'll be one more innocent Palestinian dead. The least we can do is call for a ceasefire because morally and directly complicit with every single family destroyed and every life lost in Gaza, we need an immediate and unconditional ceasefire because anything less for future generations will never forgive or forget us. On a personal note, my family and I had have devastating news that one of my immediate relatives' family, four generations, has been bombed and uh, their house has been bombed and collapsed. 45 known casualties fatalities and 20 missing under the rebels. That happened in Deir al-Balah in the middle of Gaza on February 22nd. My father learned about it on the news that night. Right now, since the war has started, there have been over 85 fatalities within the Yagi family in Gaza. So I ask you, Waterbury, to act like human beings and call for a permanent ceasefire. Thank you. Next speaker from 82 Bracken Road, Nada Ch Chatter. Nobody? Nada Chatter. I didn't prepare anything. I'm just going to go by common sense. Where's the humanity, I ask? Just, just excuse me, I'm sorry. Just got to uh, give us your name and your address, that's all, for the record. Nedel. Uh, she already said the address. Of, um, no, just so, uh, the address. I'm, just for the record, we need the address. What's 82 Brackenridge? Okay, thank you. I don't think that's really that's a okay. concern. But anyway, where's the humanity, I ask? I ask all of you, where's the humanity? Where does it make sense? Okay, we all condemn what happened on October 7th. But do we condemn everything that was happening before? Do we ever hear about it? Nobody. Okay. So, like my daughter said before, um, over 85 people of my husband's family have been brutally murdered. It's, um, they've targeted a whole generation of four generations of Yahweh's um, that died in one, one targeted event. So I'm just asking for all our money instead of spending on targeting Palestinians and children, 17. We'll say 30,000, half of them are children that have died. No food, no water. It's the first day of Ramadan and just one day of not eating food not having water and food, it's, it's, it's a lot, you know? So you can imagine three months of children trying to have a safe place, warm place to um, just survive, you know? We take, it, we take for granted just us. When we lose power for a day or an hour, we go nuts, you know? So can we imagine all the kids over there with no food, no water, just trying to survive? when they should be playing, getting an education, doing something with their life. This world, Gaza deserves a ceasefire. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I just didn't prepare anything. I just would say, 
instead of using our money for bombing people, let's use it for water bearing, helping the education, teaching kids streets, everything, you know, doing something with it. All I got to say is ceasefire now. Thank you. Next speaker from 109 Ridge, Ridgeway Avenue, Ty Wren. Good evening. Um, to begin, I want to say I fully stand with the people of Palestine, as most of us here do today. I'm here as a concerned Waterbury citizen. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Yes. Just got to state your name and address for the record, okay? Ty Wren, 109 Ridgeway Avenue. And we are urging our Board of Aldermen to pass a ceasefire resolution, urging you all to stand for something. The narrative is already that our city and our board have nothing to do with international conflicts, especially in Palestine. Nobody wants to touch the subject. But we are here as a community telling you that we have a say on this matter. There are Palestinian Muslim members of our community that are affected by this, whether it's directly impacted, as you've just heard, whether it's emotionally or physically. Whether it's to be liked or not, as the very multicultural city of Waterbury, we have community members that are here that are affected by everything. That anything in this world does in fact concern us as a multicultural city. And that is why we can take a stand on this as an international uh, occurrence. As citizens of the state, we deserve a say in the complicity of the American government who has already chosen a side, that is the side of Israel. The American government provides $4 billion in aid to Israel for their weapons and their army, and specifically Colt Manufacturing and Sikorsky with bases here in Connecticut provide arms directly to Israel to continue the genocide of the Palestinian people. That is why it matters to us as a state and as a community that is affected by this, it matters to us as a city. We are here telling you as a community that we do not want to be a part of this, we will not remain complicit, and we urge those of you with power to speak up as well, to stand for something. It's being said that this doesn't matter for us, and yet we're late to the party. Bridgeport, Hamden, Windsor, Hartford, and New Haven have already deliberated on this exact matter, as of other towns and cities that might not have gotten as much coverage, but that is about a ceasefire in Palestine, and it's time for us to catch up. I've attended those other city council meetings, and coming here now to my own city to this meeting to speak has shown how purposefully exclusive and difficult it is in terms of speaking up and having our city stand for something. This meeting is being held during Ramadan, the first day of Ramadan, when people are supposed to be breaking fast, they're here instead giving public comment. But after following local news and the huge uproar around the Charter Review Board that was attempted to be done behind closed doors a couple weeks ago, and the way the community showed out for that, as they are now showing out for this, the community is not to be ignored anymore. As Democrats and Republicans, if you believe in democracy in our city, then you will hear us and finally stand for something. Something that the community wants, as each of you represent us, not the other way around. Again, we are here to make a statement in support of the innocent people of Palestine and to call for a ceasefire resolution to be passed so that our city can be on the right side of history when the hammer falls. Thank you. Next speaker from 23 Wadsworth Street, Michael Mato. <coughs> How you doing? Uh, my name is um, Michael Matovu. Um, I live on um, 23 Wad Street, uh, Wadsworth Street. And I'm here before you, oh, actually, hold up, hold up here. Um, I'm here to talk to you, or sorry, I'm here before you to talk in support of a ceasefire solution. Um, we, um, ceasefire solution, sorry. Um, we all in this room, I'd assume, have jobs. Um, we put in neck breaking hours to enrich corporations that don't even care about us, but at least we're getting paid. Um, never what we deserve, but at least we're getting paid. Or no, but nonetheless, we're getting paid. Um, we work these hours, put in the necessary work to then get a weekly or bi-weekly paycheck. Um, and in that check, money is withheld um, for tax purposes. Um, taxes we hope, we, we hope can be used to better our way of life. Uh, you know, fix the roads, um, provide us with free health care, strengthen our education system and the buildings we educate our children in. Um, keep uh, or keep us safe and keep us safe in a way that we that doesn't entail or that doesn't only entail pouring money into a police force that endangers the life of black and POC people and also providing us with reliable public transportation and etc but no um, the tax dollars we labor so hard for um, are given to are given to um, Israel um, our money is being sent over to Israel to fund the social services there. 
um, while we suffer with hardships here that could easily be solved if our politicians cared to keep our tax dollars here and fund us, part of what our, our hard-earned tax dollars are sent over for is for the settlement of Israeli settlers, for the resettlement of Israeli settlers from European countries and here in America. Um, here in America. The other part is, the other part that they're being funded, or our tax dollars are funding, is the advanced weaponry we send over there, we send to Israel to kill innocent Palestinian lives. Um, that'd be, um, oh, to kill innocent Palestinian men, women, and children. Um, these Israeli settlers are given heavy subsidies to move into settlements that were once Palestinian homes, homes that are taken by force. And we're paying for this. We go to work and pay for this. Um, we give annually about like $4 billion to Israel, which is like roughly over $1,000 a citizen. Um, and that's coming from our paychecks and what, you know, our everyday lives. Um, you know, hard, and hardworking American citizens. America has, so America has the ability to afford the social services we so rightfully deserve. But it's spineless politicians like Johanna Hayes who we elect to help us, but instead want to play the fence and still keep, and still keep voting to send money to Israel, but has the audacity to wish the Muslim people of her district a blessed Ramadan. I just think that's shameless, shame on her. Um, so I'd like to conclude by saying James Baldwin, an American writer, civil rights activist, and revolutionary, once stated, he has terrified, he has, oh, he has, he, he was terrified at, in his time of the moral apathy, the death of the heart, which was happening in the country in his time. He based this moral apathy on the conduct of the people and not, what the, and not by what they said. And that same moral apathy he saw then is the same moral apathy I see around the country and around the world, really. Um, so yeah, that's it. See, uh, so thanks for your time. Free Palestine from the river to the sea and ceasefire now. Next speaker from 11 Steuben Street, Lawrence V. DiPello. Good evening, Lawrence DePillo of 11 Steuben Street. I'm going to have to uh, change the venue a little bit here, back to uh, Sacred Heart. Uh, I read something earlier that I want to read again to you. Should you pass this ill-advised proposal for the city to purchase 13 Wilkett Street, you do so knowing full well that it is going to be a financial burden on us taxpayers. The mayor already said that. It's depleting our ARPA funds needed for infrastructure repairs, such as streets and sidewalks. That's a fact. And uh, it's putting our homeowners and residents in the residential neighborhood at risk from an over-concentration of halfway residences. And it property is only being purchased by the city to frustrate our zoning laws. And on that only allow halfway residences in an industrial IG zone. Now I heard a number of people get up here tonight and talk about the homeless and talk about the good works that will happen at this facility. That's not the issue. It never has been the issue. The issue is that the city of Waterbury has zoning laws <coughs> and they're meant to protect every single one of you as well as me and my family and your families. How many of you have been before the Zoning Board or the Zoning Board of Appeals? Or had a family member go before the Zoning Board of the Zoning Board of Appeals? Because somebody wanted to take a two-car garage and change it into a four-car garage so that they could work on three or four cars that didn't belong to them. Or they wanted to add a second story on their house that only allowed for single residential. Or they wanted to add an apartment 
that they were going to rent to somebody because they needed additional income. Where did you go running? You went running to the zoning board and you went running to the zoning board of appeals because you were looking for their protection. I helped a number of people in Tom Plot who were just in that situation. What you're saying tonight is you don't matter. You don't matter out east and we will destroy your neighborhood by having the city buy the property and go ahead and violate the zoning. Knowing that we're violating the zoning, knowing that we're putting a facility where one is not allowed. Nobody is telling Renaissance, nobody is telling the church nor anybody else that you can't put a rehab facility or a homeless shelter or anything else in a proper zone, industrial general. We have plenty of industrial properties in this city that are vacant. You want to put a halfway facility for women and men, then you put them in the proper zone, which is what was determined in 2013 needed to be done to protect the citizens of this city. If you vote for this tonight, you are voting for every citizen in this city of Waterbury to be abused. And next time you or your family member or your, member, met, uh, your neighbor comes to you and says, this is what this person is trying to do, why don't you remind them how you voted tonight and tell them, you know what, it didn't matter for the people on East Main Street, it doesn't matter to you either. I wouldn't help One them, and I'm not going to help you. I want you to see, I want to see you say that as an older person and see whether or not they want to put you back in these seats. Because that's the issue here. It's not whether or not halfway houses should be in the city, it's where they should be located and whether or not you're going to destroy somebody else's neighborhood to fund the archdiocese to find a spot for the renaissance that does not belong in that zone, that's what it's issued tonight. And for you to vote this tonight and say zoning does not matter in this city, then don't just say it to them. Say it to every single one of your neighbors who you have let down tonight. Thank you. Next speaker from 43 Colonial Avenue, Alyssa Hughes. Alyssa Hughes, 143 Colonial Avenue. First and foremost, I want to say Ramadan Mubarak to the Islam community here right now. I'm here for a ceasefire <coughs> also. I want to first address why does the ceasefire correlate to Waterbury? It correlates very much to Waterbury because Waterbury is very familiar with violence against brown and black communities and communities of underprivileged or any other aspect that acknowledges us as minuscule. First and foremost, I want to say to the council members, thank you for being council members and thank you for your positions. And also, I want you to recognize and realize who you are, because I see that predominantly it's here, it's predominantly half black and brown people, and it's something to be proud of. Um, being a black woman in Waterbury um, and experiencing all different kinds of things um, because of my identity. Um, when I talk about violence in Waterbury, I think it's important to, for us to address the history of violence in Waterbury and how it correlates globally to the world. In 2016, we had an officer that was found guilty of sex trafficking. How does sex trafficking correlate to Waterbury? A 19-year-old girl in 2020 was raped and kidnapped at the Apple, Big Apple Motel, which is still open. People demanded justice for it, but we never got it. Some even standing outside the police station also acknowledging the fact that Waterbury had a connection to sex trafficking. Why do I bring these topics up and why, why are they relevant, again, to a ceasefire where people are being bombed, killed? We have a position, this moment in history, and I'd first like to ask the gentleman to the side with the burgundy shirt to please be quiet. Because as I waited for my turn to speak and listen to the testimonies of people, I heard rebuttals of evilness, I will describe it as. Because what 
is humanity. Humanity is love. Humanity is trust. Humanity is taking a stance. And Bridgeport, and also in other cities mentioned, they have been calling for the ceasefire, and some have even already solidified it. I think it's important for us to realize our positions in history, our positions to the youth. I look at the youth and I think of the people that have influenced me as a youth. Sean Mosley, a member of your council member. I was in CONCAP. So I see these, these young Palestinian, and, and not just Palestinian, but Muslim people here today, and the youth, and we need to take a stance. We need to let them know, hey, we got your back. And it's all so simple, just by calling for a ceasefire. That's one step to making Waterbury great. Thank you. Next speaker from 81 Birchwood Street, Vina McDermott. Good evening, respected authors. I am here tonight as a concerned resident of Waterbury, um, 81 Birchwood Street, Vina McDermott, uh, a concerned resident of the state of Connecticut and the United States. I am here tonight because I have been witnessing live on social media the most documented genocide in history. I am here tonight because our elected officials are ignoring the demands of their constituents. I am here tonight asking the City of Waterbury Board of Alders to support a ceasefire resolution. I've learned the Board of Alders feels that a ceasefire doesn't apply to the city. I feel quite the opposite, that it absolutely does apply to all of us. For several weeks now, each and every day, I have been calling our elected officials, our representatives and senators in Congress, asking that they demand an immediate and permanent ceasefire to end the siege of Gaza, allow for humanitarian aid to get to the people of Palestine, and to vote no on any resolutions providing money from our hard-earned tax dollars to fund Israel's military. They have not listened to us. Those who voted them in to their positions, so now we have to come to you our local elected officials of the city of Waterbury and ask that you do the right thing and stand on the right side of justice and humanity. Support a ceasefire resolution. Please listen to the people. I, as well as thousands of other citizens, have been the voice of the people of Palestine who have no voice. No one is listening to them, and it is well past time for you to listen to us. We know the statistics. We've heard them over and over again. 30,000 plus innocent Palestinians killed, innocent men, women, and children, thousands and thousands seriously injured. Many children are now orphans. Orphan children lose their family identity in Gaza. Orphan children in Gaza have an acronym, WCNSF, Wounded Child, No Surviving Family. Can you imagine the trauma that these children are experiencing every single day? We know that people are literally starving to death due to Israel's blocking of humanitarian aid through humanitarian borders, which is a war crime. The situation is dire, and it's happening right in front of all of our eyes. And the state of Connecticut invests millions of dollars of public employee pension money into Israeli companies, funds from pensions from our municipal employees, teachers, and state workers, $95 million. Our government is sending billions of dollars, our tax dollars, to fund Israel's military. Wouldn't the city of Waterbury put good use to some of those tax dollars that are sent to Israel? This money could be invested in our schools, our infrastructure, our social services, health care, and our housing. Money that we need here in this country, in this city, is being used to support a genocide, and our government is complicit. Americans, particularly those here in Connecticut, as a state home to many weapons manufacturers that are supplying weapons, should be very concerned that there are no conditions put on Israel. They continue to destroy Palestine and its people with no accountability whatsoever. We cannot let this continue, and we need to call for an immediate ceasefire within our local communities. We have families right here in Waterbury that are from Palestine, families that have lost so much we should all be demanding a ceasefire. And as someone who works with children, my heart breaks for the children of Gaza, 
that are still alive, suffering so much trauma. Some have died from heart attacks due to the stress and trauma they've experienced at five years, age, five years of age. These children will suffer enduring trauma for the rest of their lives, and that trauma has become vicarious trauma for all of us here. Many of us are witnessing the horror of what is happening in Gaza every day, live through social media, and we are suffering ourselves as we continue to watch what's happening, and our government is complicit. One minute. Thank you. As a Muslim, it's my obligation to speak out against any injustice and oppression. We're shouting from the rooftops for our government to stop being complicit, stop funding these atrocities, stop aiding Israel. Tonight, we're raising our voices here to ask the city of Waterbury to do the right thing and support a ceasefire resolution. Please be on the right side of history. Ceasefire now, free Palestine. Thank you. Next speaker from 17 Broxton Avenue, Omara Love. Hi, my name's Amira, and I, I live at 17 Brox Avenue, Waterbury. <coughs> Hello, and Ramadan Mubarak to all those celebrating. My name is Amira, and instead of having a big feast to break my fast with my family, I'm here today as at Waterbury City Hall breaking my fast with a date so I can ask Waterbury to call for an immediate and permanent ceasefire. I would like to start off with a statistic from Amnesty International. Every four minutes, an in, uh, innocent Palestinian is killed. As someone who has had 85 members of their family brutally murdered, not only by Israel, but by the bombs and warplanes funded by the US tax dollars, 45 members martyred in one bombing. My peers and I are wondering when this will end. How many lives will have to be taken for America and you, Waterbury, to call for an immediate and permanent ceasefire? In the last 156 days, at least 30,000 Palestinians have been killed and 72.7 others injured in the Israeli airstrikes on Gaza. While millions have been displaced, my uncle and his family being a part of the millions thrown from their homeland, this is not a war. This is collective punishment and a clear attempt at extermination. Israel has ended generations dating back to biblical times and destroyed most of the churches and mosques in Gaza. Yesterday was the first Tarawih prayer of Ramadan, and the Muslims of Gaza prayed on the rubble of what used to be Al Farouk Mosque. We cannot keep saying that the call for ceasefire is too complex when the reason to cease fire is right in front of our eyes. When babies are dying from starvation, that calls for a ceasefire. When children are getting their limbs severed, that calls for a ceasefire. And when dead mothers are getting ripped from the grips of their children, begging for them to come back, that calls for a ceasefire. This is not a war, this is a genocide. Aid trucks are being blocked from entering, and when, aid, and when an aid truck was brought to the desperate people of Gaza after denying the Gazan people aid for over a month, the IOF sprayed Palestinians with bullets, killing 112 and injuring 720 Palestinian men, women, and children. These people were trying to get flour. I'll say that again. These people were just trying to get flour. Not to mention Palestinians are being pushed farther and farther south, seeking refuge and not finding it. I would like to say again the statistic that I said in the beginning of my speech. Every four minutes, an innocent Palestinian is killed. Silence is compliance. So I am pleading with this council to call for an immediate and permanent ceasefire. Thank you. Next speaker from 44 Sharon Road, Sarheer Omar. Whew. I just uh, opened my fast, which was 12 hours without food and water. I wanted to let the Muslims know that there is a, a bed sheet outside in, in case you want to pray. Uh, so you can do that, and iftar will be downstairs. So with that said, and I normally don't use paper or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say my name, but um, I just need this right now. Okay. I begin my testimony with the name of God, the most gracious, the most... Excuse me, just for the record, your name and address? It's coming. I didn't start your time. Okay, all right. Uh, Mr. President, aldermen and alderwomen, 
and guests, greetings of peace, and blessed Ramadan to those observing. Hi, Sean. My name is Sohir Umar, 44 Sharon Road. I grew up in Waterbury. I am an alumna of the Waterbury Public Schools. I see the Zimmermans here too. You as well. Oh, no, you didn't go. Your wife did. I'm a director of institutional research and a statistics lecturer at Connecticut State Community College. Hello, Bilal, my colleague, at Naugatuck Valley here in, Naug um, in Waterbury. I'm here to address you all on the most recent Israel and Palestine conflict, which has been horrifying and unconscionable to witness. You heard the statistics over 1,200 Israelis and over 30,000 Palestinians. Innocent lives have died, and 70% of them were women and children. 70% women and children. Even more disturbing is the fact that this conflict is mostly funded by our hard-earned tax dollars. According to USA Facts, the United States sent Israel $3.3 billion in fiscal year 2023, 99% of which went to IDF, the Israeli military. Meanwhile, meanwhile, one-fifth, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, one-fifth of the residents of Waterbury live below the poverty line. That's unacceptable. And the largest demographic, the racial or ethnic group that lives below the poverty line is white, followed by Hispanic and Latin and black and African American. Why are we sending our tax dollars overseas to kill innocent babies, boys and girls, instead of uplifting the residents of Waterbury out of poverty? I teach statistics. Do you know that the students at our community college, nearly half of them, aren't ready for college level math? Half my class can't round numbers correctly. Instead of funding the foreign, affair, foreign military financing program, we should be increasing the funding for early college opportunity programs such as Gear Up and Upward Bound. We should be investing more in public education. We should be investing more in workforce development. I know someone was here from Workforce Investment. It, it's it's mind-boggling, and you know why do we come to you? Why do we come to our city council? You know why? Because our representatives in Washington D.C. aren't listening to us. The U.S. president, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., and our Connecticut congressional delegation. And I'm looking in the camera because I want them to hear this. They're not listening to us. We went to them before we came here. So we, as concerned citizens, are coming to you, our local leaders, to say, please, make a formal statement to the US government to say, stop sending our tax dollars overseas to fuel death and destruction, and invest those monies, reallocate those funds to American cities, including the city of Waterbury. So we urge you to place the ceasefire resolution on your agenda. This is an opportunity for you to speak up against injustice. My brother here invoked Dr. L Martin Luther King. What did he say? Everyone knows this quote. He said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Isn't that right? This is a moral crisis, and we must rise to it. So again, we urge you to place a ceasefire resolution on your agenda and to pass it. I'm going to conclude my remarks by quoting Aaron Bushnell. He was a US serviceman, may God have mercy on his soul, who set himself on fire outside the Israeli embassy two weeks ago. 
He said, quote, my name is Aaron Bushnell. I'm an active duty member of the US Armed Forces, and I will no longer be complicit in genocide. He said, I'm sorry, my fast, and I'm also getting Miss, that's time, but we, go ahead and finish, yeah, I'm okay? Gonna, I'm gonna finish it. He said that I'm about to engage in an extreme act of protest, but compared to what the Palestinian people are experiencing at the hands of their colonizers, this isn't extreme at all. This is what our ruling class decided will be normal, free Palestine. End quote. Thank you. Next speaker from 26 Seymour Street, Efren Gonzalez. Good evening, board, uh, board members. My name is Efren Gonzalez, 26 Seymour Street. I'm here tonight also in support of this uh, ceasefire. Uh, resolution, I would or, uh, urge all you board members to put it on the agenda at least and talk about this, you know. Uh, that's one issue. The, uh, the other issue that I'm here about is six months ago I was there under the previous administration and I addressed the issue of crime on the area where I live, uh, 26 Seymour Street. That, uh, that area down there is affected uh, very hard with drug activity. I've been working, I've been trying to work very hard with the police department, but the police department got tired of me already, and they don't even answer to, uh, they don't even answer to, the, uh, to my phone calls no more. But that's okay. I decided to go a step uh, ahead of them. I went to the state police. I gave the complaint to the state police. I'm going to see what the state police is going to do about this matter. Uh, and also, I'm also contemplating on uh, suing the city of Waterbury for uh, uh, this, you know, situation that's going on over here of me addressing the issue to the Waterbury PD, and the Waterbury PD, it goes in one ear and out the other ear. So those are, uh, 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 that, that's an issue that, you know, I'm, uh, I'm contemplating, I'm doing. I have tried to call the uh, chief of police. I left messages, nothing. Nothing. Uh, I talked to the secretary, Charlotte. Anyway, so those are two issues that are, you know, concerning here tonight, and I want all of you people to, you know, listen to this carefully. The, uh, the, cease, uh, the ceasefire has to be addressed. I don't know exactly what the city is able to do because this is more of an of a, uh, international deal, but if there is funding, uh, that might affect uh, the city of Waterbury because of this uh, ceasefire not taking place. I would sure like for all the board members to look into this and place it on the agenda and you know work with this. Uh, the other issue is going back to Sacred Heart. I spoke before on the deal. Many people spoke. I heard a lot of people uh, pros and I heard a lot of cons. Uh, Again, I am a lifelong citizen of the uh, uh, citizen of Waterbury. I've been all my life here. I was born in Puerto Rico, but I came a year and a half. I graduated to all the schools here, and everything. So, going back to Sacred Heart, like Larry the Pillow said, nobody is knocking their project. I think they have they have some good ideas. I think that that they want to help people. I think. You know, I think the project is good. I just don't agree with the way, the way, uh, the way this came upon. Now, Larry DePillo has a, a very excellent point on, 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 on zoning. I myself, I myself uh, had purchased a grocery store about six or seven months ago. I went to the zoning board just to get a, 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 a beer license, a grocery, not and the zoning board gave me a hard time, gave me a hard time. So now, why, why is the zoning board uh, taking preference to, to the city and, and not to other people? That I don't understand. 
I don't understand. If that zoning area over there is zoned for a certain way, then somebody else wants to come and rezone it again. It cannot be done. It cannot be done. So that, uh, it doesn't make sense. One minute. It doesn't make sense. So anyway, and bottom line to this conclusion here is, don't think that Ephraim, Ephraim has died. I'm still around. Just because I'm retired, but when, when you know, certain things come upon, I will come and speak. Thank you very much. Next speaker for 41 Wind Glen Drive, Fai Saeed. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Fat Saeed, 41 Wood Glen Drive. Uh, what I said in Arabic is, in the name of God, the most greatest, the most merciful, I come to you in peace. I come for you to save my children. If we were Palestinians, we would have been slaughtered. If I went to Palestine, we would have been murdered. Nothing more, nothing less. We're Yemenis, but our blood is Palestinian. For crossing the border, I went there. They treated me like an animal. Just because I was a Muslim and a well-known activist. And by the way, most of my work and all of my work is nothing but peace. We don't need a whole law enforcement, nothing more. I can control my people more than the whole police force, just like I did in Hartford. I'm just putting that out there. I'm someone who cares for all people and someone who calls for peace. We heard some statements about civil rights leaders like Malcolm X or Nelson Mandela. Back in the 60s, they talked about the freedom of Palestinians, including Dr. King, Malcolm X, who said that Palestine should have their land. And now we, we're coming because we feel that we're oppressed, that we are second-class citizens. In 2016, I led the largest protest in Connecticut for the Democratic Party. And I'm not saying I'm for the Democratic Party or against the Republican Party, not at all. But we put the work in. And I was with lead activists, not only in Connecticut, but throughout this country. And we, we won that election. And now hardcore people within the leadership are coming back to me and telling me, do it again. But our people are being slaughtered. Our people are being killed. How is that acceptable? One side is trying to ban us, and the other side is trying to kill us. We want freedom. We want to be treated like humans. We want to stop being killed. Free Palestine. Next speaker, please, from 12 Valentino Drive, Ferrara Verez. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. My name is Farha Feroz, 12 Valentino Drive. I was in ninth grade at Waterbury Arts Magnet School when news broke that a gunman had murdered 20 children between the ages of 6 and 7 years old at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut. If it weren't for the unfathomable evil in this world, those children would have graduated high school and would currently be attending college or choosing a vocation, contributing to making our world a better place with their bright minds and fresh dreams. Our world was shaken by the horrific events of that day, and we continue to hold those children and their families in our hearts as we advocate for gun reform in this nation. Fast forward to 2024. Over 12,300 children have been murdered in Gaza within 156 days. The World Health Organization Director General Gabres has told the UN Security Council, nowhere and no one is safe. The UN describes the Gaza Strip as a graveyard for children. A child is killed on average every 10 minutes in the Gaza Strip, from infants to 17-year-olds. 75% hadn't even lived to their teens. 17-year-olds lived through four wars only to be killed in the fifth. And 10-year-olds had their lives ended before adolescence, while 5-year-olds 
four-year-olds were deprived of the joys of preschool and a soul-shattering number of babies didn't even reach their first birthday. As of today, at least 21 children have died of malnutrition as aid sits just kilometers away, blocked by the Israeli government and its citizens from reaching children who are withering away into corpses before they've even died. UNICEF has estimated that more than 1,000 children in Gaza have had one or both of their legs amputated within these last 156 days. UNICEF reports that at least 17,000 children in Gaza are unaccompanied or separated, each one a heartbreaking story of loss and grief. Please tell me, what goes on in a child's head and heart when they're pulled out from under their rubble after days without food or water? Watching their family members be torn limb from limb, realizing that their friends and classmates are no longer on this earth with them, when they are able to run and play one day and are wheelchair bound the next, losing both their parents who are supposed to protect them and care for them, be forced to grow up and provide for their younger siblings with the harrowing weight of survival crushing them from atop their shoulders. What goes on in a child's heart and head? The reason I brought up Sandy Hook at the beginning of this testimony is because we as Connecticut residents, having experienced the trauma and everlasting impact of the tragedy at Sandy Hook with the loss of such precious, innocent lives at the hands of senseless violence, we as a state should be at the forefront calling for an immediate and permanent ceasefire in Gaza. Nothing, nothing will ever justify the murder of one innocent child, more so 12,300 innocent children. How can we sit here silently and say we value the lives of children when we know our tax dollars are being used to drop bombs on innocent Palestinians? And I want to make it very clear that calling for a permanent ceasefire does not negate accountability or application of international law, including the return of hostages. That all comes after. Calling for a humanitarian pause or a six-week ceasefire is the epitome of hypocrisy, visualized in real time as the U.S. funds both the bombs and meager humanitarian aid being dropped in Gaza simultaneously. No child should ever look up to the sky and wonder if what's falling is bombs or bread. You might think, well, what's the point of Waterbury calling for a ceasefire? I've been a Waterbury resident since I first came to this country at four years old. And what I love most about this place is its diversity, cultural and religious vibrancy, and the way we always show up for one another. One minute, miss. Waterbury residents want to stand on the right side of history, alongside residents of Windsor, Bridgeport, and Hamden. We don't want any more blood on our hands. So as our representatives, represent us. If our senators in D.C. don't want to listen to us and we can't make change from the top down, we must go from the bottom up. If Waterbury joins the other towns in calling for a permanent ceasefire, we pressure the state and eventually we pressure the nation. What will be your legacy, Representative Hayes, and everyone here right now? What will you tell your grandchildren? Because we won't forget what happened and continues to happen in Gaza. Everything is well documented. The genocide is being televised right before our eyes. We as human beings with a conscience and morals refuse to be complicit in this genocide. We refuse to sit silently as children are slaughtered. That is not radical or extreme. That is human. Being silent whilst this genocide unfolds is what is radical and extreme. We demand that you put a ceasefire resolution on the agenda and call for a permanent ceasefire. Thank you. Next speaker from 45 Pier Street, Sharon Samaska. Good evening. I'm Sharon Samaska from 45 Pier Street. I'm sorry. All I can say for what I've been hearing this evening is that this is a very difficult meeting, and I wish that it had been done under the circumstances of a special meeting, because it's hard to talk and it's hard to follow what has been said in the sense of just bringing it back to Waterbury. I can understand how these people feel. I'm of German descent. As a young child, I was picked on. My name was clearly German. I can only imagine my family because we were never allowed to know them because they lived on the wrong side of the East Germany, West Germany line. And that's all I can say is I feel the pain, but I don't know what the answers are. If I can bring this down to our Waterbury for a while, 
Um, I wanted to say thank you for the Bristol Babcock signs, but there's much more to do. NVP still is awaiting information on the ordinance, what's happening with that, with the signs and the fencing. And I would hope that we would get an answer. I would ask that as the Charter Revision Committee is doing its work, that residents be invited to have input, that residents be advised, and that we get to see what's happening. And I say this specifically with good examples. I volunteered with a commission in town for eight years. And that commission acted appropriately for six and a half to seven of those years. When things changed, I will go through the things that happened that are not on the ordinance. And there are things that worry me about people being put on boards and commissions. As many times as the question has been asked, how are these people vetted, we still don't know. At the first meeting with three new commissioners, none of them had read the ordinance, none of them had read the charter, no one knew what that commission was about. That is worrisome to this board, it is worrisome to this city, it is worrisome to our residents. They should not step up and take that position without knowing what they're doing, how they're doing it, and what their responsibilities are. I went to the first meeting, I'm not gonna repeat my story there, but I will tell you that a person who was on another commission was allowed to take an executive position on this commission as well as another one. That is against the ordinances and the, commission, the charter. You can't do that. You can be an executive on one group, not two. I think that it's very difficult when we do this. In January, you people voted on a member for the commission who had resigned in 2023. What does that do to the quorum? Effectively, pretty much negates it. Another person on the commission, if that commissioner was not called, I'm going to say I'm very hesitant that that person would be able to continue because of transportation and health. Do people talk to the old commissioners, the veterans, and say, hey, are you gonna do this? Or are they just appointed in the blind? We need commissions that work. That's what they're here to do. They're here to follow their ordinance. And for someone to say, we're not gonna do anything that's difficult. We're just gonna take an easy path. That's not what government is about. We don't take the easy path. We take the path that's right. Okay? And I'm concerned that we're not doing that. Next step, thank you to Kevin Zach. I don't know how many of you saw the article today, but he is applauded for his work on the Naugatuck River. He has saved it over and over again. I do have a concern. The CODAM apparently is in danger of breach. I believe the Naugatuck Valley Council of Governments is working on that issue, but I have an issue to share. In the, I believe it was- One minute. The, I believe it was the 55 flood on that river, at that flood, my husband's family lost everything, and I mean everything. As we're taking down dams, I implore this board to look into what are we doing to protect the river now, because that's not going to change. If we take out all the dams, the water will flow faster, and we know we are in a problem with climate change. I had 13 inches of rain in one week, and I believe I had five or six last week. We are getting to some really concerning levels. And I would ask that you look into that to protect our safety. As far as property goes that the city takes over, my next request is that when we look at taking over a property, it's not just money. Revenue's important. But if we don't have the funds in this city to support our first responders, our police department, and our people, what are we doing adding more buildings that in 10 years will be nothing but another brown That's field? time. Please take into account these things and hopefully we can do better. Next speaker from 97 Idlewood Avenue, J. Wad Ashraf. My name is Jawad Ashraf, 97 Idlewood Avenue. <clears throat> uh, your president and the board, 
um, as our first speaker here, or the first gentleman uh, spoke, you brought up this editorial, which when I read, um, almost shocked me. Uh, I was confused how some of these people here, I don't know everybody here, but some of the names, when I went to the voting ballot, I remembered looking at these names, and I was able to pick. And these are supposed to be our speakers who represent our voice. And I was surprised to listen to this editorial that we can't even get words together. We can't even get like a resolution to be debated. That's a concern for me. Whether you go one way or the other, but you don't want to debate on it, that's a concern for me. That prompted me to write an editorial in response, and it got published. I don't know if you read the response. I'm going to read that right now. That's what I'm going to do with my time. Aaron Bushnell, 25-year-old active duty special man, serviceman in the Air Force in the ultimate form of protest, set himself on fire to make not only a political point, but a moral point. One may question, why go that far? The piercing question that should be asked are, what were the conditions of society that would compel such a form of protest? This is not the first time a self-immolation has occurred to protest wars that directly affect every state, every city in this nation. Perhaps the most famous one was that of Norman Morrison in 1965 to protest the Vietnam War right under the office of Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, who later wrote in his memoirs that it was a significant turning point for him. Sometimes society becomes complicit, and often due to lack of adequate coverage, it loses its moral core. Often it takes an extreme act of protest that symbolizes the magnitude of the moral depravity and suffering to bring the focus back onto our moral core. With this color in the background, it's sad to hear that our elected officials are shying away from even words of concern for the most documented genocide of our times, unraveling right in our living room. This never happened before. With this color in the background, it's sad to hear that our elected officials are shying away from even the words of concern for the most documented genocide of our times if we do not have moral fortitude to even speak against an extreme form of injustice. That is something we need to address. Lastly, we elect our leadership. They serve us and represent our voice in spaces and platforms that we, the people, do not have easy access to. Nearly 80% of Americans would like to see a ceasefire. Waterbury has a significant Muslim population, but it's not only the Muslim demographics. It's not only the Muslim demographics. We should not minimize the reality of young Jewish and black Americans and young Americans in general who are all united calling for a ceasefire. Some of the most powerful forms of protest and citizens have come from Jewish organizations. One minute. We call upon our leadership to represent our voice and join other townships in Connecticut all across America to do the same. We elect representatives to voice our concern. If they shy away from that basic obligation, then we organize to ensure that the ones we elect do. As a Waterbury resident, I need to hear my voice augmented from my elected leadership. Hamas should return all 130 Israeli hostages. Israel should return 9,000 Palestinian hostages. There should be an immediate ceasefire and a discussion to achieve peace through a two-state solution, the stated policy of the United States. That much we owe to Aaron Bushnell, who sacrificed his life for the soul of his country. And I want to just take, if you will permit me, I want to take 25 seconds to honor the memory of Aaron Bushnell, a real American hero who has not been honored as such, who's been maligned. So I want to take 25 seconds 
to honor his memory in silence. That's time, sir. Thank you. Next speaker from 97 Idlewood Avenue, Sarah Ashraf. Assalamu alaikum and Ramadan Mubarak for all. My name is Sarah Ashraf. I am 15 years old and currently attending Crosby High School. The reason I am here before you today is to show you the urgency of a permanent ceasefire in Palestine and Israel. The Board of Aldermen clearly stated that they didn't see how our small town of Waterbury had anything to do with the situation in the Middle East. How does this affect us? Plainly and simply, you aren't listening to your constituents, the same people that elected you in office. The masses here in Waterbury advocate for a free Palestine and an end to the firing in the Middle East. Staying silent and doing nothing greatly hurts us as a people. You aren't representing us. Secondly, Waterbury staying out of things is impossible. Just like when voting someone for office, not voting, not saying anything is definitely saying things, more than words can express. With our support and pushing for a ceasefire in the region, we can end the loss of lives on both sides. Thank you and ceasefire now. Next speaker from 19 Ludlow Street, Karen Jackson. Um, before I start, I just think it's kind of repetitive for the person to say my name and address and for me to repeat it again for the record. And it's already on, on the record. It's kind of so. Um, the reason I'm here, uh, I, I have. Can you state your name and address, please? <laughs> That's what you have to do for the record. I'm sorry, I'm not. Yeah, but why have him do it? Understood. But you need to state your name and address. Karen Jackson, 19 Ludlow. Thank you. Okay, so then you, sh you shouldn't have him do that then. That's really silly. Um, the reason why I'm here, uh, I'm, I'm of Jewish descent. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a Jamaican Jew. And so I had no idea what was going on, but this is the, the, what's going on in, in Palestine is going, going on for 75 years. And unfortunately, the passion that's here, I appreciate hearing it, but it's not for the Board of Aldermen. They are going to vote on it positively and put a resolution on a volcano, but um, that's not, uh, it's, it's good to, to, to show that passion here, and, and, and that, but it, it should be also pushed to the state senate, representative, and the federal level, because that's where the money is going in particular. But the reason why I'm here um, is three things that has particularly to do with me. Um, one is the, uh, the Department of Health um, has a code in enforcement violation. I just moved here last May. Um, I reported over 20 violations and nothing has been done. I mean nothing, zero. I've gone there about 15 times, spoken to Mr. Lee, ignored, called City Hall, spoke to the mayor's office, ignored. Um, I have no electricity in my room. I live in a four bedroom, second floor apartment. There's no electricity, it's like the, the retaliation of that. I re reported this to the Fair Rent Commission. And then um, the, when I reported this, I was greeted with a, a, a reply from Alderman Wexler saying that I'm being evicted anyway, why am I writing the, the, the rental commission? She should not be discussing my case at all, or even sending me an email in that fashion. And then the landlord was laughing at me in the other email because of, of what she said. Um, so I, I thought that was a great introduction um, to what's going to happen on the Fair Rent Commission. But the Fair Rent Commission did accept my application, and that's going forward, so thank you for that. So the other thing is that I was driving, I, I don't know what the street, um, it was by a school, I didn't know it was a school either. but. Um, a Caucasian woman came in the middle of the street and said, stop. Now, in my neighborhood, where I live near Willow. Most Caucasians, the women that are there, they're on some kind of drugs. I don't pay attention very much. 
So she's in the middle of the street saying this. I'm like, why am I stopping? I put my head out the window and she ignored me. She turned her back to me. I'm like, okay, this lady's crazy. So I went around her and went down the street. So I was bombarded at the crosswalk by apparently staff members from the school saying that I'm going through a, a, a fire drill. There are no children in the road and they're blocking my egress. Around 7.30 that night, the Waterbury police comes to my house and says, well, you have a, you're, you have a ticket for um, interfering with the crosswalk. So I should have gotten a ticket for the stop sign because there was a stop sign there too. So I went through the crosswalk. That, that never happened. So a false report was called in by the principal of that school and I'm gonna take it all the way. And I'm gonna have that case dismissed and sue the city. That simple. Um, because you don't make a false report and have the, the police come into my house telling me some garbage that I have to sign something to that effect. Um, the last but not least, um, when, um, this was October of last year, I'm driving down by the green there. I don't know, again, I don't know the place very well. But um, uh, car number 13, a police car, tried to run me off the road, literally, because I blew a horn on him because he didn't move when the light turned green. Um, I went to the police commission, made a complaint, nothing was done. I haven't heard a reply back. Um, it's not the first time I've been treated ill by the Waterbury police. They came to my house, a landlord stole items um, from in front of my um, door. I made a report. I was told by the Waterbury police to get lost. Literally, that's what he said. I recorded it. Um, One minute. So those are my minuscule problems comparatively to what's going on in, in um, Palestine. But um, I want the, the resolution sh is going to be passed. It should be passed uh, accordingly. It's a teardrop in, in what's really going on. But I also want the passion to go to the to the to Hartford as well as the, the the senators that we have coming up for election in November, and the congressmen we have coming up for election on November. That's where you should be pushing it. Thank you very much. Next speaker from 27 Coral Drive, Vanessa Negron. Thank you so much. My name is Vanessa Negron, 27 Coral Drive. Uh, my my question uh, to everyone around here is uh, if you, do you feel your heart beating uh, for any, any, any of you, you feel your heart beating. You're still a human, okay? You're still a human. We are all humans. I remember, uh, I don't know, a couple of years back when I when I started uh, being in the Palestinian side was because I have read uh, some of the history of my own land, Puerto Rico, okay, um, where we couldn't fly our flag. 50 years ago. And then I said, what, why is this happening? I couldn't understand why. Uh, we're, we're looking at, uh, uh, at the elimination of, <laughs> of the people of Palestine right in front of us, 4K, in black, not in black and white, in color completely. You could go anywhere. You could go to the TV. You could go to TikTok. You could go to Facebook. You could see it everywhere. Don't say you don't see it. Don't say. We cannot say the Holocaust happened anymore because it's happening again. When is going to be, when they say never again, never again is again now. Never again, it has to be now again. Waterbury has a very large population of Palestinian, Muslim, and people that have a heart, and they're still human inside. They feel the cry. And even if we are a little tiny city, our representative and our senators are not listening to us. <coughs> We are calling every single day three and four times and we have not received a, a, a call back or an email back from them. That's why we come to you. 
Even though, like somebody said around here, it's just a, a, a teardrop. A drop will take the, the water out of the, of the whole cup. A drop. One drop is all it needs for the water to boil, for the water to come out. We are humans. We see it. 1,400 children. Kids, kids, children are being killed by not having food or water. 1.4% of the population in Gaza. Can you imagine if this is happening here in Waterbury with 3 million people? Imagine that. 1.4% of the population in Gaza had been killed, murdered by our testimony. The people that we support. Look inside your hearts. Look in the mirror when you get home and say, do I still have a heart? What can I do? Please, cease fire now, even if it's just a drop in the cup. Free Palestine. Next speaker from 413 Harpers Ferry Road, Paul Condash. Good evening, Mr. President, members of the board. My name is Paul Condash, and I reside at 413 Harpers Ferry Road. Please, please do not let loud rhetoric, veiled threats, and references to the Charter cloud your judgment on the purchase of the property's sacred heart. This board is on legal ground, supported by the Corporation Council, and has the full authority to approve these purchases. It's time to do so tonight. Thank you. Mr. President, that's the last speaker tonight. Okay, thank you. Um, with that, the next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from the Monday, February 12, 2024, regular meeting and public hearing, and the meeting from Friday, February 16, 2024, Sheriff's Call Special Meeting. Alderman Dorso, is there a motion? Motion to approve the minutes is read. Alderman Martinez McCarthy? Second. Motion and second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion carries, and the minutes are approved. Uh, on your desks, you should have in front of you the uh, revised real estate contract, 413 Wilkett Street, and also the uh, ARPA, ARPA funds, how they were spent, what is remaining, uh, and that was uh, given to us by Michael LeBlanc, Director of Finance, and Sarah R. Gary, our Manager of Budget Development and Oversight. Um, on our agenda tonight, items 10 and items number, item number 11 are withdrawn. Uh, and to, to start, we are going to um, take up new business item 20 and unfinished business one and two as a uh, committee of the whole. And with that, uh, Alderman Dorso, so is there a motion to resolve ourselves into a committee of the whole? So moved. Alderman Martinez McCarthy. Second. Motion and <laughs> second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Ayes have it. The motion carries. We are sitting as a committee of the whole. Item number 20 is a request for approval of a proposed su successor collective bargaining agreement contract between the Waterbury Public Health Nurses, CHCA, District 1199, NUHHCE, AFSME, AFL-CIO and the City of Waterbury, submitted by Emily Cadman, attorney for the uh, Corporation Council. Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. 
The ayes have it. The motion carries and the contract is approved. Unfinished uh, business item number two is a request for approval of a budget transfer within the city's capital improvement fund for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2024, in the total amount of $1,050,000 uh, uh, submitted by Sarah R. Gary, Manager of Budget Development and Oversight. Uh, Alderman Dorso, is there a motion? Motion to approve the budget transfer. Alderman Martinez McCarthy. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Alderman Elsa. This on? <laughs> At this time, I have to disapprove of this completely. Uh, first of all, I just got a re revised contract for purchase this, this evening. Second of all, there is absolutely no preparation done for this purchase. And I, I don't know how anybody expects us to get involved in this. It's uh, irresponsible. That, that the best way I could say it and at best, it's, it's immoral. We are asking the people of Waterbury to accept the fact that we're going to ignore the zoning because it's something we, that our administration wants. And legally, they may, and I say that with a real question mark, be able to get around it. But at the same time, morally, you're telling the people of Waterbury, we do what we want because we have loopholes to get around it. There is no answers to any of the questions that we asked for. I got a ridiculous, and I, and I use that term loosely because it's, it's, it's even worse than that, estimate for cost to repair and do some work on the school building, one of four buildings. But when you tell me, and I, I ask anybody to tell me how you can remove floor tiles at one cent a square foot, how you can get painting, ceilings, trims, and doors for 24 cents a square foot. Another part is nine cents a square foot for removing floor tiles. Removing existing paint on masonry walls, 11 cents. New flooring, VCT, new flooring, 45 cents a square foot. You can't even get the stuff out of the dumpster at Home Depot at that price, let alone get it put in. This is, to me, just an insult. Here's a piece of paper. We told you what it might cost us. There's no validity to this whatsoever. This is absolutely ridiculous. Anybody that knows anything about buildings and doing anything cannot accept this as an answer. I don't know how anybody here could possibly do that. If somebody came to you and said, you're going to remove floor tiles that in one place on the third floor, one cent a square foot. That's, and nowhere in here do I see any cost associated with the disposal of the asbestos, with the lead paints, which is astronomical to throw away. Once you, you might get it out, if, if you could find somebody to remove it at one cent a square foot, I'd be afraid of who did the job. But if you did, how are you going to throw it away? It's asbestos tiles in that building. You can't throw them away. Not by this budget. It's going to cost you a fortune. So they come down here with a whole number of a million dollars with all the other things that they add up in here to fix the building. I submit that this one million dollars, given the square footage price of many of these things, is more like seven or eight million dollars minimum. And we're supposed to buy this as factual? I don't even know where they found these numbers. And whoever put them together is definitely not qualified for doing the job that they did. Because, to be honest with you, I had to submit things like this at my job. I'd have been walked out the door if I put this on my boss's desk. 
This is ridiculous. We cannot justify buying this building if this is the type of information we're being given to make the decision with. Given all the other things being okay, this is still just total nonsense. And there's no way possible that anybody here should accept this. And if you do accept it, it's because you've been told to, not because you believe in it, because I don't think there's a reasonable person that could ever look at these prices and think that's right. It's impossible, impossible. And again, it's only one of four buildings. We have three other buildings that have to have pro done, things done. And yes, Renaissance is gonna do two of them and everything. The church building needs a lot of work. I'm very, very, very concerned. If this is the type of information you're giving us that anything at all that's being said is truthful because this was just a, here, give them something and shut them up. Well, it's not gonna shut me up. It raises more concern than anything. So I, I ask, I implore everybody on this board to be responsible enough to say, no, do the right thing. Show us the right numbers. Let us make a decision on the right things. So I know it's a budget transfer, but it's, a, you know, it's got to do with what we have, what we have to work with. So I, th there's no way, any way, shape, or form that you'll ever see me support anything with this kind of nonsense being its proposal. And I'm insulted that you even think that I would fall for it. There's a whole thing about being transparent. Well, you're very transparent. I can see right through this. It's nonsense. Thank you. Further discussion? Alderman Lopez. Thank you for recognizing me, Mr. President. May I, um, Sarah, could you come up, please? Just real quick, you can say yes or no. Um, has anything changed from the original request approval, requesting approval from February 12th of a million fifty to today? Good evening, Sarah Gary, Manager of Budget Development and Oversight. Um, you know, Alderman Lopez, um, this budget transfer was submitted to the board on February 1st and it was held at the last meeting. Um, so we're asking you to take action tonight, but this is the original transfer that was submitted to the board on February 1st in a total amount of one million fifty thousand dollars. It would be nine hundred and fifty thousand to purchase the property on Wilkett Street with a hundred thousand dollars for repairs and maintenance of the property. That's um, just preliminary repairs and maintenance and securing the property is what that hundred thousand would be used for. So this this transfer is just simply to so that we have money properly allocated to purchase the building. Correct. Thank you. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in, oh, I'm sorry, all the women Zimmerman? Thank you for recognizing me, Mr. President. <clears throat> Just to be clear, this is a, a fund transfer from our ARPA dollars to an account to pay for the Sacred Heart property. ARPA is the American Rescue Relief Plan money that we received during COVID times. And originally, and for the majority, has been used and has been told to the residents that we were gonna to use to fix our infrastructure. Now I'm big into marketing, so I don't know if you've seen the trending meme going on online in social media, but it's a heart with a pot bowl full of water that says, welcome to Waterbury for a Valentine's Day. The people are screaming about the streets and the sidewalks. Did we, and I'll ask this, I don't know if this is, we, we, told, we were talking about pulling the area. These residents bought this area to live around a school and a church. We are drastically changing the usage of this property. I don't believe we pulled the area. So I will not be supporting this transfer. I think there's a lot of questions, a lot of collaboration and a lot of conversations that need to be had. And I don't believe that ARPA funds are the way to be spending this money. And I'm a little insulted that we're buying this for a homeless shelter, a reentry center, and 
halfway rehabilitation to help people, and we have to buy it from the church after we bought St. Lucy's, after we bought St. Mary's, after we bought St. Joseph's. Thank you. Further discussion? Hearing none, oops, uh, excuse me, yeah, they, uh, Alderman, Alderman Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, and one of the uh, public speaking, sorry, I'm not going to ask you a question, I'm sorry. I don't want oh, to, to keep you. standing up there. Um, in one of the uh, public speaking, I heard from the CEO from uh, Renaside that they've been trying to buy this property for f over four years ago. Now, knowing the uh, zoning that they already knew about it, why didn't they keep looking somewhere else at the IG area instead of keeping in this look into this property, you know, uh, I don't get it. Because we, we were supposed to, you know, we have to follow the rules of that's why we voted, this body voted to have these halfway houses in the IG area. And we, I heard that since O'Leary, they're trying to buy this property. For what reason? Because we already changed the zoning to the IG. So, this is have to me. It's kind of red flags that we are still trying to do something that has already been done to change. So these are the things that I don't know why we are moving money away from one thing to another when you know this property you guys are looking to is not in the zone. Mr. President. Are you, are you, all, yeah. You're done? Okay. Uh, Alderman Alsef. Yes, I'd like to put a, point out one other very obvious mistake here. Um, 100,000 square feet of repairs to pavement and replacement for $15,000. I can't get my driveway done for that price, and it's far less than 100000 and far less than the work that needs to be done. I'd be afraid if we got somebody to come in for that price to begin with. But again, just please, I, I, I ask that this be tabled, and people look at these numbers for realism. I, I, I really don't know where these numbers came from, and I'm, I'm sad that anybody thought that this group of aldermen here would be foolish enough to take this as gospel truth. It's, it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous and can't be justified by anybody. So again, I, I just ask everybody to please take a look at that piece of paper and decide if you really want to fall for this and you really want to put your reputation on the line for these ridiculous numbers that you're going to be told to use. because. It, 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 no way it's going to happen, and I just want to go on the record that that's going to happen. Given that, I make a motion to table. Okay, we have a motion to May table on second. the floor. Second. Motion made by Alderman Asaf to table it. Uh, Alderman uh, Rodriguez with the second. Uh, any any discussion? May I remind? the yes. chamber that we actually have a motion which has been seconded That's right. we do. it's going to recess for one moment please motion the table takes precedence
what your rules are. Okay, we'll come uh, back to order, and uh, Alderman Alsa, I, I ask that you just uh, withdraw that motion, and uh, Alderman Rodriguez, uh, withdraw your second, and then just uh, restate the motion. And hey, Mr. President, um, I've been asked to withdraw the motion to table, and given uh, the explanation that if I make a motion to amend, let's let's. Uh, Let's second that first and withdraw your motion. I'll second that. Okay, the motion to the table has been withdrawn. And now uh, state your motion. With the understanding that my motion to amend the motion on the floor to read, to table it till a future meeting is the same effect. I will make the motion to amend my last motion to table. The motion on the floor is to, yes. To amend the, the motion to this little record table. reads it that way because yes if that motion was to pass your amended motion passes the the item would be tabled okay so if you made your motion is there a second i'll second that there's a motion on the floor to amend the approval uh to a table uh, all those uh, any discussion all those in favor signify all the women's airmen I'd just like to say I think it the responsible thing to do is to table this so we can have more conversations. Thank you. Further discussion? 
Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 Uh, let's roll call. <clears throat> Alderman Elsa. Yes. Alderman Cavallo. No. Alderman Dorso. No. Alderman Hunter. No. Alderman Lopez. No. Alderman Mosley. No. Alderman Martinez McCarthy. No. Alderman Rinaldi. No. Alderman Nujang. No. Alderman Rodriguez. Yes. Alderman Talagene. No. Alderman Salvio. No. Alderman Weaver. No. Alderman Zimmerman. Yes. Alderman D. G. Ovin Carlo. No. Twelve no, three yes. Okay, the motion fails. The motion on the floor now is to approve, uh, once again, back to the original motion to approve the uh, budget transfer within the city's capital improvement fund for the fiscal year ending 3024 in a total amount of $1,050,000. Uh, I'd like to restate my motion to table this without an amendment. Your, your motion to table it was, was my motion was, was to amend it. It was not to table it. That's what you explained to me. It your was motion amended. was to properly, your motion was to made properly table it. That's the correct way to try to table the motion, the, the original motion. We've discussed it. We voted it down. We're not discussing it again. If you'd like to discuss, uh, once no, again, I the I just uh, want the record transfer. to show that I've been told Robert's rules is precedent, and that's what I'm utilizing, so. You make your ruling, you're the chair, you got that op option. Further discussion? Alderman Mosley. Yes, thank you for being recognized, Mr. President. Um, I, I know we have um, leadership here from Connecticut Renaissance, um, and I, I know they spoke very briefly earlier, um, but I just had a, a few questions if you all would be able to address them. Um, first and foremost, if you can speak again to your, um, you, you mentioned about being able to consolidate operations in one location and, and food service for that. And I was wondering if you could speak more to the body regarding the benefits of consolidating the operations in one general geographic location. Just come up to state your name and try. Uh, Kathleen Deshane, 24 Central Avenue, Connecticut Renaissance. Um, so, I, uh, originally, we've been in um, the, the former convent, and we've been there for about 40 years. So, can you, can you repeat that? We've, we've been in the convent um, providing a work release program for 40 years. For 40 years, got it. Yeah, this, this year makes 40. Got it. We have Thank a 40 you. year lease with the archdiocese, and um, so we started talking with the archdiocese. Um, it's got to be at least five or six years ago because they were interested in selling the property. And initially, we, we only wanted to stay at, um, we, we refer to it as Waterbury East. Um, so we were interested in purchasing that building. We actually got as far as making an offer. We went back and forth with the archdiocese only to realize that we couldn't buy that building because it was not subdivided. It was part of a larger lot and the archdiocese didn't have the authority to just sell us a single parcel of it. Um, so that, that turned into a larger conversation. Um, when I started meeting with Mayor O'Leary about a year and a half ago, um, I learned that the city was interested in purchasing the property and that they wanted to buy the whole and that they would sell us uh, the former convent. That then turned into a conversation um, about the rectory being available, that the, the city had no um, intention for the rectory. And while we'd been at 24 Central for about 20 years now, um, we thought it would be a good idea to bring that program over to the same campus so that we might be able to share some services, some staffing. Um, 24 doesn't have a kitchen. 24 Central Avenue doesn't have a kitchen. So it would kind of promote an ease of use to be able to cook out of the former convent and bring the food right down to uh, the rectory. Thank you. Alderman Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. President. Hi, how you doing? Hi. Um, my question to you, do you have a number of how much you were offering the, uh, 
the art the Hartford to buy the property? When we were talking about yeah, the purchasing of the whole property. Uh, well, we we started negotiating, but then uh, and and we went as far as to get an MAI uh, appraisal, uh, but but then realized it was a moot point. Now, for my understanding, you guys are interested in the rectory and the convent. Yes. Yeah. We we didn't we weren't initially because we already had this property at 24 Central. Um, but once I started meeting with Mayor O'Leary and learned that they didn't have any purpose for the rectory and that that would be available, then we started talking about moving our 24 Central Avenue program over to the rectory. Now, um, knowing that... I'm just going inter to interject here. Uh, we're going to save... This is for the budget transfer. We'll save all these questions for the actual purchase, if, okay. yeah. if that's fine with everybody, instead of yeah. no problem. You know, having... It's, it's okay. It's fine. It's okay? Thank you. Thank you. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, uh, signify by saying aye. Right. Aye. aye. Well, Opposed, no? No. Opposed. Okay, roll call. Yep. <clears throat> Alderman Elsa? No. Alderman Cavallo? Yes. Alderman Dorso? Yes. Alderman Hunter? Yes. Alderman Lopez? Yes. Alderman Mosley? Yes. All the woman Martinez McCarthy. Yes. All the Rinaldi. Yes. All the men Nujame. Yes. All the men Rodriguez. No. All the men Talajin. Yes. All the men Salvio. Yes. All the woman Weaver. Yes. All the woman Zimmerman. No. All the men D G O and Carlo. Yes. Twelve yes. No. Okay, 12 yes, 3 no. The motion, the, uh, the ayes have it. The motion carries and the uh, transfer is approved. Uh, unfinished business number one is a request for approval of a real estate contract for the purchase of properties at 13 Wilkett Street, Sacred Heart Church Building, Rectory Building, School Building, and Covenant Building. Submitted by Michael LeBlanc, Director of Finance. There a motion. Motion to approve the contract is read. Motion made and seconded. Discussion. All the rooms Zimmerman. Oh, sorry, Ruth. Uh, Kathleen, would you mind coming back up to the podium, please? Thank you. And thank you for what Renaissance does for the community and for others. We do want to help. Like, I'm not going to speak for the board, but I'm sure a majority or all of us are very uh, concerned and interested in helping others and helping people in our community. I just want to get that clear because a lot of people have said different things in public speaking, and I don't really think it was that fair. But we're looking at this from a business perspective as well as you can imagine. So I do have a few questions. Um, if we do purchase this property, when is, do you have a perceived period of time? Are you buying it immediately? Is there a period of time in which uh, Renaissance is thinking of when they would purchase the property? As, as soon as it was available for purchase. Excuse me, I'm sorry, just state your name again uh, oh, one more time. Uh, I apologize. Kathleen Duchesne, Connecticut Renaissance, 24 Central Avenue. Thank you. And is Renaissance doing the repairs to make it ready to purchase, or are you, per are you doing the repairs to the building to make it inhabitable? To both buildings, to, to the former convent and rectory? Yes. Yeah, so we, we've started making repair. I've, as I said, we're, we've been at uh, the former convent for 40 years, so we've already started uh, making repairs. We put a new driveway in, we put a new uh, boiler in, New windows, new flooring, uh, renovated bathroom. So that that property is pretty well renovated. And then we plan to do the same with the rectory, um, and we'd like to make it uh, ADA compliant as well. And does any of that have to be done before you purchase the property? Does the city have any commitments to you to make any rehabilitation to the building before you purchase it? I don't believe so. Okay. I think uh -huh. that that would be an arrangement with the Department of Corrections since that's where our contract is from. So I do have approval from the commissioner of the Department of Correction to move ahead with moving. Uh, they're not approving our purchasing, but they're approving our moving from 24 Central to the rectory. So that, that was my first step. Okay, do we know how much, do you have a, do we have a contract of intent with you or anything to kind of show a commitment that you're purchasing? 
the rectory in a price? Uh, no, nothing that formal. Okay. Well, my other question is just, uh, actually, I'll save my question. Uh, Mr. President, if anyone else wants to ask. Well, Alderman Rodriguez. Um, that's right. <laughs> We're going to continue with the conversation. Um, so my question to you, so knowing the zoning that it was already implemented, um, have you decided to check the IG areas to purchase those areas instead of uh, the um, church? Have you looked into purchasing area in the area where it's halfway house is supposed to be? I, I haven't because it wasn't my initial intention. My, my initial intention was just to purchase the convent because that's where we, we've been. Um, but when that came up for discussion, we've, we've been at 24th Central Avenue. We own that building. We could stay there. Um, but when that came up for discussion that that was available, then we started to you know, engage in conversations with the city. So in the year and a half that you've been looking to purchase this, you haven't looked in other areas in case this doesn't go through? No, we would just remain at 24 Central Avenue. Okay. I got there's, all no, the there's no reason for us to have to move. It's just more ideal for us to be on a campus and also along with other human services like the uh, Northwest Regional Workforce right. Development Board. If we were all on one campus, it would provide seamless services so that our clients could you know, receive training, education, um, they could go for certification. So just the idea of this being a re-entry campus was um, you know, particularly ideal for us. One more question. Um, have you did the research in the area with the residents to see if this was fit for them to be, for you guys to be there? No. Okay. No. I mean, we, we've, I, I guess we're considered grandfathered in because we are, we've already been there for 40 years. Yeah, but so, we're, bringing, we're bringing more people into this area. Yeah. So that's a concerning right. for a lot so of residents. So I, I guess I assume that since the city was purchasing the property that they would do their due diligence. So you are telling us that we have to do the research. Well, I, I assume since the city is purchasing the property. But you guys are bringing more people in yeah. to those areas. Well, I guess it's up to the city to tell us whether or not we could move there. OK. I got more questions, but not, uh, I have more questions, but for the WDC and other people. So I'm good for now. Further discussion? Right. Alderman uh, Tajaldeen. Thank you. Thank you. I have my question is actually not for you. Um, if you want to sit down, I'm sure you'll be called up again. Um, I have a question for Chief Spagnolo, if you could come up. And thank you for answering our questions. Yes, thank you. Yeah, that's what I said. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening, Chief. Good evening. Uh, my question, can you talk a little bit about the impacts of halfway houses in our residential communities. Um, I know we have, at least I saw a listing from a couple years ago of at least four halfway houses. Um, what's your relationship, not, well, not necessarily yours, but what's the police department's relationship with the halfway houses? Do you see a spike ever in crime or are you able to help mitigate because you have a familiarity with the folks that are there? Can you describe a little bit what that might look like for the neighborhood? Sure, Fernando Spagnolo, police chief, thank you for the opportunity. Um, we work closely with the halfway houses. Um, you know, as far as the Connecticut Renaissance, they are a, a, an incredible organization to work with. Um, the property uh, that they currently reside on up on Catherine Avenue, Wilkett Street, uh, depending on your, your pleasure of what you want to use for an address, there's only been one call for service there that the police department's been to uh, over the past year and a half. Uh, it was a criminal mischief call, some damage to a car. It may have occurred when the person was going to work. So. There were no issues that are in the house. Um, Central Avenue, a little more high density residential. We've been there about 20 times throughout the last year and a half. The majority of those calls were calls 
uh, service-related calls, medicals, assisting other agencies like probation or parole uh, that were going to, to do uh, welfare checks and visits. Um, you know, having Connecticut Renaissance uh, clients in one location would be extremely beneficial uh, to the police department as, as a department head that's responsible for public safety and safety in neighborhoods. You know, I look at that Wilkett Street corridor um, and it's, it's really no surprise to anyone here, it shouldn't be, it's a little distressed right in that area. Uh, we've had our struggles there uh, with, with violent crime, we've done a lot of work there, we've, we've conducted a lot of investigations over the last couple of years. Um, we've been out there with the health department, zoning, building, RX, community relations, blight, um, you know, to, to clean it up. But there are a lot of services that are available for people uh, who are struggling in our community right in that area. You've got uh, the Welcoming Center, you've got uh, GWIM, right, uh, Greater Waterbury Interface Ministry, that is really doing such great work but busting at the seams. It could, they really need some help. Um, and then you have Sacred Heart, which is a distressed property, uh, and it concerns me, you know, and I'm, I, I can't speak for the fire chief, but we've had discussions about it, uh, and I know it concerns him. I mean, these are properties that are, are partially vacant, you know, they fall into disrepair, um, they attract an element that we're looking to get rid of, especially in, in our, com you know, community, but especially in that specific neighborhood. Um, so... Nonprofit organization partnerships that the police department and the city have with organizations like Connecticut Renaissance, Northwest Workforce Reinvestment Board, uh, really are, they're bar none. <laughs> they bring a lot of money to the table, they bring a lot of experience to the table, they bring programs. And the reality is, is that the people that Connecticut Renaissance serves are coming back to our community. You know, um, we run two Reentry programs at the police department in conjunction with all of our uh, nonprofits that service that, that particular um, sector of our community. We run Project Safe Neighborhoods, and in collaboration with our parole and probation offices here in the city, we require each and every member being released from the Department of Corrections going to the care of Connecticut Renaissance to come to a meeting once a month. Uh, at that meeting, we have Vendors such as Northwest Workforce Reinvestment Board, Mask Manufacturers Alliance. Um, we've got Help Incorporated. We've got the Health Department with their harm reduction folks uh, that, that provide information on where to go for services in our, our community, how to get a job, how to get training for a job, and dispel all those rumors that you know. You know, once you come back to the community uh, after being released from jail, you, you can't get any work. It's just not true. It's simply not true. So. You know, having one location where we could have training, everyone that's, that's uh, you know, at least the Connecticut Renaissance is, is uh, uh, servicing in one area would be very beneficial to the police department and to the programs that we run. And as a follow-up, um, I assume the police department probably patrols the area regularly just in the course of the day as usual. Um, do you have any concerns about being able to patrol the area if we had another halfway house move to the neighborhood? No, no. I mean, and, and really, there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot of activity. There's a lot of governmental activity that occurs in these, these halfway houses. There's probation officers and parole officers, oftentimes accompanied by a police officer um, to, to visit clients or to pick up a client. There's Project Longevity. These are uh, care service coordinators that are picking clients up to bring them to job interviews or bring them um, to training or bring them to a medical appointment. So there, there's, a, there, there's a lot of activity that occurs, um, you know, as far as government is concerned in, in these halfway houses on a daily basis. Yep. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you answering my questions. Alderman Mosley. Yes, Chief. Uh, first, thank you for uh, acknowledging me, Mr. President. Uh, Chief, question. Um, from your professional opinion, um, is there any benefit to Renaissance consolidating their services in this one um, general geographic location from a law enforcement standpoint? Yeah, absolutely. I think there is a benefit, and, and for the police department, there would be a benefit because, again, those programs that we run, being able to go have a one-stop shop, uh, being able to have a, a training center facility you know, on the grounds um, would be extremely beneficial to 
the care service coordinators, the social service coordinators that we employ through grants to help with reentry back into our community. So yeah, it would be very beneficial. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion? Alderman Elsa. Yes, I'd like to point out a part of the agreement here, purchase agreement, uh, section 11, due diligence and contingencies. So the buyer shall have up to 30 days from the date of complete execution of this contract within which to undertake its review of the property, including but not limiting to zoning, environmental, building code, and other legal requirements. Part two is physical inspection related to the condition of the property, including but not limited to mechanical and structural integrity, and an environmental review, and the lease affecting the agreements, um, lease agreements affecting the property. I would like to make sure that this is exercised because it seems a little bit um, obvious that they put this section in a contract for a reason. That's so you can find out if this place has asbestos, it has lead paint, it has lead mastic in the ceiling tiles, it has falling bricks, it has crumbling walls, it has mold problems, all the things we know about already. So I want to point out that this is put into the contract that you're asking us and I assume was approved by the people who think that this is a good idea. So the fact you put that in there, I want to make sure that you exercise that and we find out that we're really buying a pig in a poke here. The place is going to cost us a fortune. So. Any uh, further questions for the chief? Not for the oh, I'm sorry, chief. Yeah, I, that's okay. No, no. I right. wasn't going to address the chief. Understood. Uh, all the women's government. Thank you. Hi, Chief. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I have two questions, I think. Um, the re-arrest uh, records of people coming out of facilities such as this, do we know what that looks like? Is it high? Um, so in the, in the last uh, year and a half, uh, from the beginning of, uh, well, actually December of 2022 uh, up until currently, uh, there were uh, two arrests that were made on Central Avenue, and those were warrants that we, we assisted uh, probation and parole to serve. Uh, there's been no arrests, um, frankly, that I can really ever recall uh, on, on the Catherine Avenue site. Okay. And then, um, from what I understand, the, wa the nearest walking distance from Central Avenue to a school is Drigg School, which is pretty far away. I believe walking distance to um, this campus, we have Career Academy, Wilson School, Walsh School. Is there a, a law or any ordinance in place for any sex offenders and being within a school distance? No, they would have to file like, you know, the, the registry, follow whatever their conditions of release were, but. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alderman Tazeldy. Sorry, Chief, just one more question. Uh, assuming that the project costs money, right? Um, I know our WDC uh, estimate, we talked on previous occasions about using some of the, the carpentry and training programs at MASC to help subsidize the costs of outfitting the building to, to need. At, from a law enforcement perspective over the city, would you, what would you say to the amount of dollars it takes to rehab this building and sort of get the campus to this vision, would that be worth the investment in a long-term increase in safety in the city or not? I guess if those are the two options I'm gonna give you. So for a number of reasons, yes. And you know, first of all, it's a revitalization program for that particular community in our, in our city, right? It's gonna, it's gonna clean up the property. It's gonna raise property values in that city. It's gonna it be, create less stress in that particular neighborhood. Uh, and then secondly, you know, the more outreach, the more uplifting we can do of people, re uh, offenders coming back into our community, um, the better off we're all gonna be. Uh, you know, citywide, statewide, 
it, it's just it's just a fact. It's a matter of fact. If, if if these folks can come out and we can give them a helping hand, we can get them some training, we can show them where to go for services, so they can stand on their own two feet and become tax-paying citizens again, and and you know, renting or buying in the in, in our mm -hmm. in our city in our community, we're certainly going to be a better place. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions uh, for the chief? Thanks, Chief. Thank you. Further discussion? Alderman Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, do we have a member from the WDC here? Yeah. Good evening. Uh, Tommy Hyde, Executive Director, Waterbury Development Corporation. How you doing? Um, where did you guys get the numbers that you guys got for the improvement of this uh, school? And second, uh, do you have an estimate of the church uh, to get fixed? So um, the, the estimates were done internally. Our uh, vice president of construction, Ron Casella, who has uh, 40 plus years in the construction industry, uh, most recently at Manafort uh, as vice president of operations, went into the building and um, put together the uh, estimate um, on its own. And we only did that building, we, we did not do the church. So the, the money that it's going to be fixed is only for the, for the school. We haven't even looked at the church of how much it's going to be costing taxpayer money. Correct. Okay. Further discussion, Alderwoman Zimmerman. Thank you. Uh, we this partially is for you, but partially not. So if you want to, if you don't want to stand here, that's fine. But uh, during an agenda item that's been put on file, I'd just like to read because we did submit something uh, that Alderman Rodriguez, Alderman Elsef, and myself have asked for the building officials who, ev who evaluated the current condition of 13 Wilkett Street be present to provide us with their findings. So I'm assuming you're part of this, right? Uh, or we're your not, team is. We're not building officials. Okay. We're a nonprofit, quasi public entity that does work um, on behalf of the city through a master municipal agreement. Did you evaluate the property? We provided a cost estimate of what we believe it would take to bring the um, property back into good use. Okay, thank you. Yeah. That's all I have for you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Are, the, are there any other officials or anyone that evaluated this property in the room? Okay. Um, we did ask for them to give us their findings 48 hours in advance, and I, I didn't receive anything unless I missed an email, so that's unfortunate. Uh, we also requested that the walkthrough be shown to the public, and that doesn't look like it's going to happen, so that's unfortunate. Uh, we requested the city planner provide a copy of the written recommendations um, to the city plan commission um 48 hours in advance is the city planner here because i didn't receive a copy of any of the recommendations either and no one can answer these questions correct okay uh, we also requested that the city uh, planning chairman of the city plan commission be present to answer any questions and that they have a copy of the most current city plan of conversion and development. Is the City Plan Commission Chairman here? Okay, so um, Mr. President, for the record, can you just explain to me when you submit um, something for the agenda, it gets put on the agenda and it gets put on file, how action comes out of that? Yeah, so your items were taken into consideration, they're put and receive in place on file. Uh, and knowing that if, by the way, we did put it on an agenda item, it would have been a request tonight from the entire board to have them possibly show up at a future meeting. Uh, we don't request, uh, three aldermen don't request uh, city person's uh, appearance. It's, that request would come to the board. We would take that request and maybe vote on it as a full board and see if that person would respond. But uh, we don't respond to the two, three aldermen. We did take your your, your, your uh, motions, we put them on as a receiving place on file, but yes, that's how it would have been done. Even if you requested them, he would not be here tonight because tonight would have been a decision to whether or not bring them in. Okay, that's interesting, thank you. 
Alderman Mosley. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. I had a question for Mr. Hyde, if you may. So, Mr. Hyde, um, good evening. The process that you all use to obtain the uh, rough estimate cost of repair, is this, is this the typical process that you all use for um, similar projects? Yeah, I, and I can you speak this, more to the process? Yeah, so I would say this was a little bit more detailed. As you can see, there was a, a significant amount of photos that we went I, in there. I can't hear you. Would you repeat okay. that, please? Um, the, the report that we put together is probably a little bit more than what we typically do for a project. Um, as you saw, we took several pictures. We spent several hours in the building um, and coming up with this estimate. But Can you sp just speak more to the difference? You said it's more detailed. Can you just speak to that? Just, just from the sense we put together a, a formal packet, I guess it, it, it is what I mean, and, and took a, a, a lot of pictures to try to back up what our assumptions were on the, on the project. But we have somewhere between, I, I think we are at 22 active projects right now on behalf of the city, ranging from the $10 million downtown utility upgrades to the multi-million dollar brownfields demolition and remediation projects to um, you know, the pools at Hamilton, Fulton, and Washington Park, and pretty much before we start any project, we would go out and come up with a bid, uh, or sorry, with, uh, with an estimate, and then once we bring uh, an, an engineer on, um, they also come up with a bid, so we would compare ours. Historically, we've been fairly accurate, I would say, um, and then obviously we would compare that to the, the final price once the, it goes out to um, construction, but, um, I, you know, it, I don't have the specifics, but I'm, I'm happy to invite anyone to WDC to go through where, what we've done in the past and how close we've been to some of these projects. So you'd say typically um, final project costs may come close to estimates, but you know, there's always there, probably- There's uh, always unknowns. So we're, we're gonna talk a little bit later about the Hamilton Park project and some of the unknowns we came in into that. So those we can't really account for, but I think this project is, is pretty straightforward you know, without finding some sort of terrible historical contamination. Got it. Thank you. Further discussion? Alderman Alsef. Yes, I'd like to ask the question, of what standard did you use to get these numbers? Uh, we, we are actively doing projects every single day, and we use um, the knowledge we re receive from those projects, as well as looking up his, um, historical and present costs. Specifically, VCT tiles for nine cents replacing? Those would be based on our, our assumptions of what the current market is for these products. <clears throat> you, you'd have to prove that, because I'm sure that every bid we had, there was no nine cents per tile. That, that I can almost guarantee. That they can't buy them for that price, let alone put them in. Um, 10 cents to repair, uh, 10 cents for 3,200 square feet, uh, 10 cents a square foot for uh, sprinklers, 24 cents for interior painting per square foot. I'd love to know what contractors you're using because they're starving to death and they're not gonna be around much longer. I'd book them all this week because they're gonna be dead next week. They're not making a living at this, no way. Um, ceiling tiles, remove and install new 12 by 12 tiles, nine cents a piece. That's, please, please. I, I, I'd like you to, I'd like you to show me what standard you're using because it's not one that's been anything I've ever been involved in. You're, and I've been involved in a lot of projects. That is just. We would be more than happy to host you at WDC. And I, I would love to see an explanation of some of these numbers. Yeah, we would be happy to host you. Oh, uh, because I, I just can't see it happening. Okay. Um, I'm not going to beat you up on it because you're going to, you don't have any answers anyway, so thank you. Further discussion? Alderman Rodriguez. Not for you, but, <laughs> so, um, and this will be my last question to the CEO. State, Hi. State my name again. Yes, please. Sorry. Uh, Kathleen Deshane, Connecticut Renaissance, 24th Central Avenue. First of all, I want to say thank you for all the work that you do for our people. My question to you is, and my last question is, um, how many people that you have already there are from Waterbury? 
and how much and how many you have outside of Waterbury in your um, halfway house. I, I couldn't give you an exact number off the top, but uh, when men are being released into the community, they typically go back to the community that they came from if there's a work release program there. So people are either from Waterbury or the surrounding areas. So my understanding is we're taking people from all over Connecticut to Waterbury, retraining them, and sending them back to their hometowns are Waterbury taxpayers money? Well, I believe there are about 15 work release programs throughout the state. So typically people go back to the community where they came from. So anyone coming to Waterbury likely was from Waterbury to begin with. Yeah, but we're training them to uh, with taxpayers money because we are going to own the school. You guys <laughs> my own but we're gonna be train, retraining them in the school at taxpayers' money. So they're going back to their hometown and paying taxes on that area with this, our money. This likely is their hometown. T typically people come back to their hometown. So everybody that you have there are from Waterbury? I, I wouldn't say everyone. There, I mean, there's mitigating circumstances. If someone has a victim in the community, they might not be put in a work release program where that victim is. If they have certain medical needs or say they need um, accessibility, then they would need to go to a program that's wheelchair accessible, which we currently don't have. So there are some mitigating circumstances, but typically you go back to the community where you came from. Okay, thank you. Further discussion? Yes, sir. Alderman Mosley? Yes, thank you, Mr. President. So just for clarification, so you currently have operations on Central Avenue, correct? Yes. So you're looking to simply move operations that are already underway from Central Avenue to the Wilkins Street yes. location. So this is not a new operation for you. It's just a transition from one geographic location to another. Yes. Thank you. Alderman Alsef. Yes, I have a question. Why we haven't been giving, given an evaluation of the church building that we're buying? It's a major portion of this property, and how do you buy something without looking at it? You kick the tires on a used car, at least. We would be more than happy to do. I'm sorry? Sorry, we would be more than happy to take a look at it. We were asked specifically for this building, knowing that it was going to be put into use. Again, we're being asked to vote on this tonight. And that's the problem for me, because I have no idea what's going on. I do have an idea. I don't have any official word of what's going on with the church. And how do we buy something like that without having a clue what we're up against? We all were in there and saw the crumbling walls caused by water infiltration. That's got to be leading to mold. The exterior walls with cracks in them. Uh, it's all that type of stuff that, that we just have no idea what it's going to cost us. But it's not one cent or ten cents a square foot. That much I can tell you. But I would like to see whatever it's going to really cost us to fix these buildings. We're buying these things blind. And it's supposed to be on faith. You know, it's not a church anymore. Faith isn't working. This is taxpayers' money. We need to be diligent. We need to be responsible to the people of Waterbury. And that's, you know, there's just no way we should be doing this. This is just immoral to begin with because it's a, to circumvent the zoning rules. And secondly, it's irresponsible because we don't have the information we need to know about the property we're buying. Thank you. Further discussion? Uh, Alderman Zimmerman. Thank you. All right, so these are the facts that I've gathered so far. We do not have a purchase price for Renaissance, so therefore we do not know what we're getting back from this purchase. That's going into our contingency fund that we're using ARPA dollars for. We have no guarantee that there's a purchase or any sort of anything in writing of intent for Renaissance to go into this uh, rectory or for the homeless whatever organization is going to run this homeless shelter that sounds like a great idea 
in the church. We don't know the price to fix the church. We don't have an actual plan telling us that we're committing to having that a homeless shelter. The Northwest Regional Workforce Board, I thought for some reason my perception was that they were going, I guess this isn't a fact, side note, I thought they were going to pay for the school since they were going into the school. Do we have any, do we have any other input on that, Mr. President? That, that was never funding. mentioned, yeah. Okay. They, they were gonna go into rehab it okay. as, as part of their uh, plan, but not, they were not to purchase it. That was never uh, mentioned, no. All right, so right now Waterbury would own, the city of Waterbury may own the school. Well, we're gonna own the school if we purchase it today. We're gonna own the school. The Northwest Regional Workforce will hopefully go into it. We don't have that in writing. We have a quote for a million dollars from the WDC, right, to fix the school, but we have, I think it's like $7 million to fix Hamilton Park, so I really don't know how much that's gonna get us through the school rehabilitation. We have no inspection. We don't know if there's asbestos that needs to be removed. And then I'm kind of confused on the land split if we do sell to Renaissance, like you guys have that wall, and I know that the rectory and the convent are kind of like parallel to one another, but how do you get around the wall and insurance and a parking lot that's in between? And so I'm not quite sure, and I don't know the a plan on how we would split that. So those are um, the facts that I'm looking at and we now have a proposal to, or a, a vote to buy this piece of property with all of these outstanding questions. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and just for the record, uh, the, uh, you were informing about the uh, City Plan Commission and Conservation Plan. That is online for public viewing, so there's no need to request it. You can always get it online whenever you like to and, and no, take I, a look at it. I realize that, Mr. President, but it would have been nice so if the Board of no, Aldermen Yes, I'm just saying, so there's no reason to request them for that. That's all I'm telling you. There was no reason to request them for that. So. Further discussion? Alderman Zimmerman. Are we not allowed to have a conversation with people from the commissions? And no, the yes, I, I, I was just letting you know that they were not in here because we did not take them in. We please received and placed it on file. Uh, once again, three aldermen don't decide who comes in front of this board. Right. It's put out and then we would vote on it if we thought the need was to vote on it. But okay. that, that's how the process works. I appreciate okay. you explaining right. that, thank, thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in, oh. Alderman Mosley. Yeah, I just wanted to state for the record, so I know that there was mention of not having a um, purchase contract drafted from Connecticut Renaissance, but in hearing from them, they've been in consistent talks with the city for years. And I think that the fact that they're here tonight, um, enduring questioning, um, standing, you know, willing to present, I think it shows a commitment from Connecticut Renaissance to really um, do some good for the city and providing these wraparound services. So I just wanted to state that for the record. Alderman Lopez. Thank you for recognizing me. I concur with uh, Alderman Mosley. I thank you so much for taking the time uh, and, and coming down. Um, I can tell that this is very, very important to you. You could have just gone straight home and not be here to answer questions. So I, I, I think that's commendable. That uh, speaks volumes to me as I'm sitting here making a decision that I think that it is someone who's genuinely engaged with their community. You have shown it for 40, for, you know, four decades. Um, I think it makes sense, right, that, that if you're trying to relocate, uh, you're relocating to where you are already existing and you have the foot, footprint. Um, I don't think you would want to, if you are looking at consolidating services and complementing the, the programs that you have, um, this, makes, this makes a lot of sense. So um, thank you for being here. All right. Alderman Tajali. As well, um, we, we've had two public hearings on this now, and in both public hearings, the Northwest Regional Workforce Medicine Board has been here saying they're excited for the project, they're interested in it, they're committed to exploring it with us. Um, we have Connecticut Renaissance, we've talked with uh, the Waterbury Reentry Center and Community Partners in Action. Um, I think all the players around the table are waiting for us to make a move so that we can figure out the finer details on this. Um, and I am ready to vote. Further discussion? Alderman Zimmerman. The finer details are all the money it's gonna cost to make it happen. 
with all due respect. Chair. <laughs> Thank you. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no? no? No. Roll call, please. Roll call. <clears throat> Alderman Elsa. No. Alderman Cavallo. Yes. Alderman Dorso. Yes. Alderman Hunter. Yes. Alderman Lopez. Yes. Alderman Mosley. Yes. Alderman Martinez McCarthy. Yes. Alderman Rinaldi. Yes. Alderman Newjame. Yes. Alderman Rodriguez. No. Alderman Talzadine. Yes. Alderman Salvio. Yes. Alderman Weaver. Yes. Alderman Zimmerman. No. Alderman D.G. Ovin Carlo. Yes. 12 yes, 3 no. Okay, the ayes have it. The motion carries and the purchase is approved. With that, Alderman Dorso, is there a motion to return to the regular order of business? So moved. Okay, we are returned to, oh, excuse me, yes. Uh, we are returned to the regular order of is there a motion to return to the regular order of business? So moved. All the moment, is there a second? Second. Discussion. There are none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion carries. We are returned to the regular order of business. At this point, we're recessing to committees. Uh, we will start with uh, finance. I call the uh, Finance Committee to order. We will consider item number three. Your Finance Committee respectfully recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve the following refunds for cancel permits Thank you. as submitted by E. Gill Graveline, Building Official Department in of Inspection. Trinity Solar Electric Permit, $585. Allstate Construction HVAC Permit $8,797.50. Alderman Dorso may have a, a, a motion. So moved. Uh, Alderman Mosley may have a second. Uh, is there any discussion? Second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The motion passed. Item 27. Item 27. Your finance committee respectfully recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve a budget transfer within the City Capital Improvement Fund for a fiscal year ending June 30th, 2024 in the total amount of $300,000 as submitted by Sarah R. Gary, Manager of Budget, Development, and Oversight. Alderman Dorso. Motion to approve the budget transfer. Alderman Mosley. Second. Is there discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The uh, motion. Item 28. Your finance committee respectfully recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve a budget transfer within the City Capital Improvement Fund for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2024, in the amount of $792,000 as submitted by Sarah R. Gary, Management of Budget and Development Oversight. Alderman Dorso. Alderman Mosley. Second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, the motion passes. There is one item on the um, uh, committee report. Okay, it's for uh, tax <coughs> purposes. Your finance committee respectfully recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve and authorize the Director of Finance to make refunds to taxpayers 
representing overpayments of tax bills in the amount of $31,333.84 as submitted by Frank A. Caruso, Jr., CCMC, Revenue Collection Manager. Alderman Dorso. Motion to approve the refunds. Alderman Mosley. Second. It, um, uh, is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, the motion passes. May I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. 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 Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. We are adjourned. Okay. I call to order the uh, Intergovernmental Committee meeting. As a reminder, we have, um, we are dropping items 10 and 11 off of the agenda because they are duplicates. Um, item 10 is item 19 and item 11 is item 18. So we'll be dropping 10 and 11. And for the items on the agenda that relate to the Board of Education, they were recently approved at their meeting on Thursday. <clears throat> Item number five. Your intergovernmental committee respectfully recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve a new job specification for a school building and grounds supervisor uh, as submitted by Tara L. Shaw, Director of Human Services. Can I have a motion? So moved. And a second. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Any abstentions? The motion passes. Item number six. Your intergovernmental committee respectfully recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve a new job specification records database specialist for the town clerk's office as submitted by Tara L. Shaw, Director of Human Services. Can I have a motion? So moved. And a second. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Any abstentions? The motion passes. Item number seven. Your intergovernmental committee respectfully recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve the proposed modifications to the following salary ranges as submitted by Tara L. Shaw, Director of Human Services, or Human Resources. Uh, item A, salary range for the purchasing director position from 90,000 to 120,000 to be increased to 105, 105,000 to 135,000. And the salary range for director of public works position from 100,000 to 140,000 to be increased to 125,000 to 175,000. Can I have a motion? So moved. And a second. Second. Any discussion? Alderman Zimmer. Hi. Can we have um, Tara? Hi. Thanks for coming. I just have two questions, and it's probably going to apply to both of the, both of these um, positions. Are we? Topped out. Are any of these, are either the purchasing director or the public works director leaving or vacant? Uh, good evening. Tara Shaw, Director of Human Resources, for the record. Um, to my knowledge, neither uh, director, uh, neither department head is, is leaving. Okay. And are they, are either of them topped out of their salary ranges? Um, it's my understanding, I believe, that um, the purchasing director is either at or very close to the current salary cap. Okay. Do you know what their salary is? That's public knowledge? I don't know that okay. off the top of my head. Thank However, you. the salary ranges don't necessarily guarantee an increase to anyone. Um, they're simply the range that can be negotiated in the contracts for department heads. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? Great. Uh, Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. No. Uh, can I have a roll call vote? Intergovernmental committee roll call. Item seven. Alderman Rodriguez. Aye. Pardon? Yes. 
Alderwoman Cavallo. Yes. Alderman Hunter. Yes. Alderman, Alderwoman Zimmerman. No. Alderman Mac McCarthy. Yes. Alderman Talagene. Yes. Alderwoman Waver. Yes. Six yes, one no. The motion passes. Item number eight. Your intergovernmental committee respectfully recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve a request to amend professional services agreement for design services for renovations to Fire Station 5 with Silver Petrocelli and Associates, RFP number 7411, as submitted by Terrence Ballou, Fire Chief. Can I have a motion? So moved. And a second. Second. Uh, any discussion? Uh, Alderman, uh, sorry, Alderman Rodriguez. <laughs> so I'm happy that you guys are uh, getting the chance to get this done, and I would love to see it come forward and uh, finish uh, for for you guys because uh, it was needed. Thank you. Excellent. Any other further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? The motion passes. <coughs> Only like 80 more to go. <coughs> Item number 12. Your intergovernmental committee respectfully recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve a no, a no cost memorandum of understanding with community mental health affiliates for cognitive behavioral intervention for trauma in schools, otherwise known as CBITS, and bounce back, otherwise known as BB, group treatment for those suffering from traumatic stress, as submitted by Carrie A. Swain, Clerk, Waterbury Board of Education. Can I have a motion? So moved. And a second. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. The mo any abstentions? The motion passes. Item number 13. Your intergovernmental committee respectfully recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve a no-cost memorandum of understanding with community mental health affiliates for Smart Recovery Group for Teens, Friends, and Family Support Services and Counseling, as submitted by Carrie A. Swain, Clerk, Waterbury Board of Education. Can I have a motion? So moved. And a second. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Any abstentions? The motion passes. Item number 14. Your intergovernmental committee respectfully recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve Amendment 3 to, to the Professional Services Agreement, RFP number 6295, with Teaching Strategies, LLC, for Early Childhood Preschool Curriculum, as submitted by Carrie A. Swain, Clerk, Waterbury Board of Education. Can I have a motion? So moved. And a second. So second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Any abstentions? The motion passes. <coughs> Item number 15. Your intergovernmental committee respectfully recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve the Fourth Amendment to the Professional Services Agreement, RFP number 7226, with Kingsley Enterprises, LLC, for fitness center equipment installation and training as submitted by Carrie A. Swain, Clerk, Waterbury Board of Education. Can I have a motion? So moved. And a second. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Any abstentions? The motion passes. Item number 16. Your intergovernmental committee respectfully recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve a professional services agreement, RFP number 7929, with Connecticut Education Network for a five-year period and in the not-to-exceed amount of $330,000 for internet services, as submitted by Carrie A. Swain, Clerk, Waterbury Board of Education. Can I have a motion? So moved. And a second. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Any abstentions? The motion passes. Item number 17. 
Your Intergovernmental Committee respectfully recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve Amendment 1 to the Professional Services Agreement RFP 7689 with Facilities Compliance Fire Protection LLC for fire suppression equipment testing and maintenance as submitted by Carrie A. Swain, Clerk, Waterbury Board of Education. Can I have a motion? So moved. And a second. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Any abstentions? The motion passes. Item number 19. Your Intergovernmental Committee respectfully <laughs> recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve a construction contract, RFP 7894, with Allstate Construction, Inc. in the not to exceed amount of $5,165,750 to provide HVAC replacement at seven elementary schools subject to minor non-substantive changes to be approved by the Office of the Corporation Council as submitted by Carrie A. Swain, Clerk, Waterbury Board of Education. Can I have a motion? So moved. And a second. Second. Any discussion? Alderwoman Zimmerman. Can we ask just for the, um, the time frame for these HVAC replacements, please? Um, from start to maybe a start estimate and completion estimate. Good evening. Uh, Mr. President, Honorable Board of Aldermen, Nick Albini, Chief Operating Officer with the Waterbury Public Schools. So we have identified the contractor for this, but this is only the first phase for these elementary schools. These are called cooling centers. So they'll be in the large rooms, the cafeterias, the auditoriums, the gyms. But with this carries a very important part. It upgrades the electrical service. I'll be in front of this board in the very near future with uh, an air conditioning HVAC system for the entire building in each classroom. So this is going to go on for some time, uh, but this is the first phase that we need to complete in the big rooms to get into the classrooms. With this, then the elementary schools finally will have uh, uh, air conditioning and ventilation. Thank you, Mr. Albini. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Any further discussion? Alder, Alderman uh, Rodriguez. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, I just want to clarify, you said 5100 and I have 5803 I just want to clarify if that was... Over here. One second. Uh, item 18. That's okay. I saw no, it. we are on item 19. Eight. Okay. Sorry, my fault. Thank you. Oh, I, actually, no. You, I did them out of. I did them out of order. Uh, but yeah, we're on item 18 for five million one hundred sixty-five thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars. Okay. That was my bad. No problem. I just wanted to clarify. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? All those uh, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Any abstentions? The motion passes. Item number 18. Your intergovernmental committee respectfully recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve construction contract for RFP 7859 with Allstate Construction Inc. in the not to exceed amount of $5,803,250 to provide HVAC replacement at multiple school gymnasiums and cafeterias as sub, uh, subject to minor non-substantive changes to be approved by the Office of the Corporation <laughs> Council as submitted by Carrie A. Swain, Clerk, Waterbury Board of Education. Can I have a motion? So moved. And a second. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Any abstentions? The motion passes. Item number 21, your intergovernmental committee respectfully recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve the fiscal year 2024 Municipal Police Department DUI enforcement grant. The total grant amount being sought is $70,367.92 covering the period of February 15th, 2024 to September 7th, 2024 as submitted by Robert T. Davis Acting Assistant Deputy Chief Department of Police Services. Can I get a motion? So moved. And a second. Second. Any discussion? We did as a general. Uh, as a whole. I'm sorry. That's okay. Excuse me. Oh. 
my pack your my packets are not in the right order. Twenty is coming up in right. the next one. Thank you. Um, Sorry for the no, no, I appreciate it. Item twenty one. Uh, any can I get a motion? So moved. And a second. Second. Any discussion? For item number twenty one, Alderman Rodriguez. Uh, we have members of the police department. Just got a question, how you guys are doing with this program, how effective it's been in the city of Waterbury? Robert T. Davis, uh, Waterbury Police Department. Uh, excellent, actually the program is very uh, successful. Actually I have the numbers from last year. Um, just for motor vehicle stops, uh, 1,037. Uh, citations issued 1,142. Uh, DUI arrests 63. Um, and that consists of a unit that only has three officers and one sergeant. So they're out there every day working various different hours to get this done. So very successful. Thank you. Keep the good work. You guys are doing a great job. Thank you. Alder Roman Zimmerman. Thank you. Yes, we definitely appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for everything that you do. Uh, quick question on marijuana usage and DUIs. How does that work at a, I'm, I've always been curious, I've heard there's like one tool in the state that we can use to measure. I'm sure that's not accurate. So how do we measure someone that's high in driving? So we actually have drug recognizing experts that are assigned to that traffic unit. They use specific tests in particular to marijuana to test people out in the field for that. Okay, thank you so much, no appreciate problem. it. No problem. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Any abstentions? The motion passes. Uh, as a clarification, uh, Alderman Zimmerman, we did skip 20 in this row, but because we did 20 as a committee of the whole, that was the bargaining, collective bargaining agreement for the nurses' union. Yep. Thank um, you. Which at this point it was, was, a while was ago, 50 so hours ago. Yeah, so it slipped my mind too. Thank you. I'm going to put that over here so we don't get them confused which takes us to item number 22. Your intergovernmental committee respectfully recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve the option <laughs> agreement for municipal virtual net metering offtake between the City of Waterbury and Green Skies Clean Energy LLC as submitted by Thomas Hyde, Executive Director, Waterbury Development Corporation. Can I have a motion? So moved. And a second. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Any abstentions? The motion passes. Item number 23. Your intergovernmental committee respectfully recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve a financial assistance proposal for Waterbury Button Factory, 835 South Main Street, Waterbury, State of Connecticut, in the amount of $3,100,000 as submitted by Thomas Hyde, Executive Director of Waterbury Development Corporation. Can I have a motion? So moved. And a second. Second. Any discussion? Alderwoman Zimmerman. I do have just a quick question maybe. So when I was reading this, it's the, we've been awarded a bond. A bond is, a, is that a loan? What does that mean when we're awarded a bond? Can so, you educate me? Yeah, so the way this works is the State Department of Economic, oh sorry, Tommy Hyde Waterbury Development Corporation. Um, the State Department of Economic and Community Development have a Brownfields grant program, which we applied into, but we did not receive. There's a secondary grants program that's housed under the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. And um, sometimes when grants aren't approved because they're not competitive, it is then moved over to the secondary program, which decisions are made in conjunction with DEEP and DECD. Um, so it, it is a grant, but in order to get that grant funding, the state has to bond it. So the state brings that grant in front of the bond commission, they bond it, and then it comes to us. Okay. And how, where in this process will the $3.1 million get us? Do we um, have kind of like a scale? And We're optimistic that it'll get us um, to debris removal. So as you remember, this is the building that burned down in July. Um, there's. The site it looks terrible right now. Um, we're hoping that it'll get all the um, debris off the site. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? As a quick question, this is the location we just um, yep. had that, that press conference at, right? Across the river, yeah. Yep, great. Yep. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? 
Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Any abstentions? The motion carries. Item number 24. Your Intergovernmental Committee respectfully recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve an agreement between the City of Waterbury and the Young Men's Christian Association, otherwise known as the YMCA, in the amount of $125,000, as submitted by Thomas Hyde, Executive Director of Waterbury Development Corporation. Can I have a motion? So moved. And a second. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Any abstentions? The motion passes. Item number 25. Your intergovernmental committee respectfully recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve the Hamilton Park Pool Amendment 2 to the contract between the City of Waterbury and Montagno Construction, Inc. for the replacement of the Hamilton Park Pool, Pool House, and Promenade. The original contract value was $8,205,304 and amended to $8,405,340 via $200,000 owner's controlled contingency allowance on June 30th, 2023, as submitted by Thomas Hyde, Executive Director, Waterbury Development Corporation. Can I have a motion to approve? So And a second. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Any abstentions? The motion passes. Item, 30, item number 31. Your intergovernmental committee respectfully recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve a construction contract for East Mountain Park water systems repairs between the City of Waterbury and Aqua Turf Irrigation LLC P105 in the amount of $146,170 as submitted by Thomas F. Crow, Jr., PE, Civil Engineer 2, PWD. Can I have a motion to approve? So moved. And a second. Second. All those, uh, any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Any abstentions? The motion passes. Item number 32, your intergovernmental committee respectfully recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve a construction contract for Chase Park House roof replacement between the City of Waterbury and Silk Town Roofing Inc. P110 in the amount of $317,800 as submitted by Thomas R. Crow, Jr. PE, Civil <coughs> Engineer 2, PWD. Can I have a motion to approve? So moved. And a second. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Any abstentions? The motion passes. Item number 33, your intergovernmental committee respectfully recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve a time and attendance scheduling system for the police department contract between the City of Waterbury and Visual Computer Solutions, Inc. in the total amount of $224,880 to cover five years, plus an additional $238,860 for an additional five-year optional renewal as submitted by Michael Ponzillo, Acting Deputy Chief, Department of Police Services. Can I get a motion? So moved. And a second. Second. Any discussion? Uh, Alderman Rodriguez. How you guys doing? Just one question. What are you guys using right now for, for that purpose? So currently the police department utilizes a antiquated- Excuse me, just, yes. just state your name for the record. Oh, sorry, uh, Michael Ponzello, <laughs> Waterbury Police Department, uh, Acting Deputy Chief of Police. Uh, so good evening. So the police department currently utilizes a very antiquated system of paper for everything. So uh, the, the process now for just our attendance alone is uh, an attendance sheet where the supervisors actually have to write in the hours worked, the, whether we're on training, a holiday day, and the same applies for our vacation time and our overtime currently. That information then gets transferred into Excel sheets. It's quite tedious. Uh, so this new system will put us all computerized. Uh, it'll allow all the officers to have an app on their cell phone where they'll be able to not only request overtime, time off, um, we will be able to live track this information, which will uh, obviously make us more compliant with a lot of the rules and regulations and our union contract, obviously. Um, and uh, this new software will also be able to 
have us you know, run lifetime reports so we could track overtime a lot more efficiently, time off. Um, obviously, the police department and our staffing shortage has been uh, causing a lot of the platoons to have holdovers. We can predict this activity a lot sooner, which obviously makes the officers' lives a lot easier. So this software will put us into the present. I don't even like to say the future because um, we probably should have done this uh, quite some time ago. Um, so this will just streamline all, all of our functions much better. I appreciate it. And yes, I'm 100% that we need to look to that level Thank of uh, um, things to do in, in our future. Appreciate Simpl it. Simplifying yes. your work. Yes, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Any further discussion? Okay. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Any abstentions? The motion carries. We have a few more. I'm starting to feel like an auctioneer. <laughs> <laughs> Running them off. Your Intergovernmental Committee respectfully recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve an Emergency Management Performance Grant Federal Fiscal Year 20-21-22-23. This grant is a zero cost item. No matching funds are necessary as submitted by Adam S. Rinko, Director of Emergency Executive Officer, Waterbury Fire Department. Can I get a motion? So moved. And a second. second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Any abstentions? The motion passes. Mm -hmm. Item number 35, your intergovernmental committee respectfully recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve an amendment one to the construction contract RFP number 7900 with All Trade Industries LLC to provide conversion of the Crosby High School weight room and firing range into a physical education space as submitted by Carrie A. Swain, Clerk, Waterbury Board of Education. Can I get a motion to approve? So moved. And a second. second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Any <laughs> abstentions? The motion passes. Item number 36. Your intergovernmental committee respectfully recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve an agreement RFP number 7920 with Crown Castle Fiber LLC for a five year period and in the not to exceed amount of $990,000 for resilient wide area fiber network services as submitted by Carrie A. Swain. Clerk, Waterbury Board of Education. Can I get a motion? So moved. And a second. second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. <coughs> Any abstentions? The motion passes. <coughs> Item number 37, your intergovernmental committee respectfully recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve a facility and equipment use agreement with Connecticut State Community College, Naugatuck Valley Campus, at no cost, as submitted by Carrie A. Swain, Clerk, Waterbury Board of Education. Can I get a motion? So moved. And a second. second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Any abstentions? The motion passes. <laughs> Last item, item number 30, last item for the Intergovernmental Committee, item number 38. Your Intergovernmental Committee respectfully recommends that the Board of Aldermen set a public hearing on March 25th, 5.45 p.m. in these chambers, determination pursuant to the Connecticut Public Act 23-5 as to whether a public hearing should be scheduled regarding additional early voting locations for the August 13th, 2024 primary election and the November 5th, 2024 general election and determination of whether to establish additional early voting locations for the August 13th, 2024 primary election as submitted by Paul K. Pernaruski, Mayor, City of Waterbury. Can, get a, can I get a motion to approve or to set a public hearing? Motion to set up a public hearing. And a second. second. Any discussion? Alderman Zimmerman. I have a question from our special meeting that we already had with the registrar of voters. Didn't yep. we have a public hearing and we voted not to have additional polling locations? Only for the presidential okay. preference primary coming up. Thank you. Um, so we're required to have one for each of the elections that may require early, or that in the exception of the uh, state level elections would require early voting. Thank you. Yep. Any further discussion? Just to, just to be clear, this is only to discuss if we are going to have a public hearing after. Well, it, this would be to set a public hearing, but it would not automatically translate into additional early voting locations. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Any abstentions? The motion passes. There you go. 
Can I get a motion to adjourn the Intergovernmental Committee? And a second? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I thought so. We are adjourned. Okay, and with that, we will return to the regular order of business. Following items are on the consent calendar. Item number one is receiving place on file. Item number two is also receiving place on file. Item number three is on consent to approve. Item four is receiving place on file. Item number five is on consent to approve. Item six and seven are on consent to approve. Items, uh, item number eight is on consent to approve. Item nine is receiving place on file. Item 12, item 13, item 14, item 15, and item 16 are on consent to approve. Item 17, item 18, item 19, item 20, item 21. <coughs> item 22, item 23, item 24, item 25 are all on consent to approve. Item 26 is receiving place on file. Item 27, item 28 are on consent to approve. Item 29 is receiving place on file. Item number 30 is receiving place on file. Item number 31, item number 32, item number 33, item number 34 are on consent to approve. Item 35, item 36, item 37, and item 38 are on consent to approve. Uh, Alderman Dorso, is there a motion with respect to the consent calendar? Motion to approve it. Excuse me. There is a second. Second. Motion made and seconded. Uh, is there any uh, discussion, any deletions or additions to the consent calendar? Alderman Zimmerman. Mr. President, please remove me from the consent calendar for item number seven. Thank you. you. Item seven? Yes, sir. Any further, deletion? Any further deletions to the consent calendar? Hearing none, the motion on the floor is to approve the consent calendar as read minus item number seven. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes, the ayes have it. The motion carries. The consent calendar is approved. With respect to item number seven, uh, the the chair, I would recognize the chair uh, of the uh, Intergovernmental Committee, uh, Alderman uh, Tajal Dean. Item number seven. Yes. It is coming right up. No, it's not in this packet. Seven, requesting approval of proposed salary modifications to the following salary ranges. Item A, salary range for the purchasing director position from 90000 to 120000 to 105000 135000 and salary range for director of public works position from 100000 to 140000 to 125000 to 175000 Can I have a motion? So moved. And a second. Motion being made by Alderwoman McCarthy, uh, seconded by Alderwoman uh, Weaver. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no? No. Roll call. Alderman Al No. Intergovernment. <laughs> Intergovernment. It's everybody. Everybody. No. Oh. Yeah, roll call. Yes. Alderman Dorso. Yes. Alderman Hunter. Yes. Alderman Lopez. Yes. Alderman Mosley. Yes. Alderman Martinez McCarthy. Yes. Alderman Rinaldi. Alderman Nugent. Yes. Alderman Rodriguez. Yes. Alderman Talladine. Yes. Alderman Salvio. Yes. 
Alderwoman Weaver? Yes. Alderwoman Zimmerman? No. Alderman D.G. Carlo. Yes. 14, yes, one no. Okay, the ayes have it, the motion carries, and it is approved. Uh, old business number one um, is a request for approval of a real estate contract for the purchase of properties at 13 Wilkett Street, Sacred Heart Church Building, Rectory Building, School Building, and the Convent Building. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Okay. Second. Motion made and seconded. Discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Roll call. Roll call. Alderman Alsa. No. Alderman Cavallo. Yes. Alderman Dorso. Yes. Alderman Hunter. Yes. Alderman Lopez. Yes. Alderman Mosley. Yes. Alderman Martinez McCarthy. Yes. Alderman Rinaldi. Yes. Alderman Nujang. Yes. Alderman Rodriguez. No. Alderman Talladin. Yes. Alderman Salvio. Yes. Alderman Weaver. Yes. Alderman Zimmerman. No. Alderman D.G. Owen Carlo. Yes. 12 yes, 3 no. Okay, the ayes have it. The motion carries, and the uh, real estate contract is approved. Old, oh, unfinished business, uh, item number two. Request for approval of a budget transfer within the city's capital improvement fund for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2024. And it, Total amount of one million fifty thousand dollars. Alderman Dorso, is there a motion? Motion to approve the transfer is read. Alderman Martinez McCarthy. Second. Motion made and seconded. Discussion. Hearing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Roll call, please. Uh, roll call. Alderman Alsa. No. Alderman Cavallo. Yes. Alderman Dorso. Yes. Alderman Hunter. Yes. Alderman Lopez. Yes. Alderman Mosley. Yes. Alderman Martinez McCarthy. Yes. Alderman Rinaldi. Yes. Alderman Nujame. Yes. Alderman Rodriguez. No. Alderman Talladin. Yes. Alderman Salvio. Yes. Alderman Weaver. Yes. Alderman Zimmerman. No. Alderman D.G. Owen Carlo. Yes. 12 yes, 3 no. The ayes have it. The motion carries. The budget transfer is approved. With respect to standing, the chair would recognize Alderman Salvio, the chair of the Finance Committee. Your Finance Committee respectfully recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve and authorize the Director of Finance to make refunds to taxpayers representing overpayments of tax bills in the amount of $31,333.84 as submitted by Frank A. Caruso, Jr., CC, MC, Revenue Collection Manager. Motion to approve the refunds is read. Second. Motion made uh, by Alderman, Alderman Dorso, seconded by Alderman uh, Mosley. Uh, discussion? If there are none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion carries and the refunds are approved. With that, is there as is our business for tonight? Is there anything for the good of the order? Alderman uh, Jane. Thank you, Mr. President, for recognizing me. I'd like to give condolences to Alderman uh, Tejaldeen for the passing of his aunt. Oh. So, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And Alderman Tejaldeen, I apologize. I did not know that I would have. We would have kept her in her prayers. So I apologize. Yeah. Anything else for the good of the order? Alderman Mosley. Yes, March is Women's History Month, and I just want to take a moment to acknowledge our dynamic women on the Board of Aldermen, our Alder women, who <laughs> do such a great job and, and keep us in line. So thank you all. Um, for the for new business, I would like to investigate the transfer station in Waterbury. Is the waste station, for what I understood, has been down for almost two years, and they haven't. They said that there was money allocated to it, and we haven't. Uh, they haven't fixed it. So I just want to know what's going on with that, and see if we have someone to tell us what's going on with that transfer station. Received, and we'll get you get you an answer. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, just a couple house 
uh, keeping items before we go. March 27th, 5.30 in these chambers is going to be uh, the budget uh, presentation. And then on April 3rd uh, at 6 p.m. is going to be our first public hearing for the budget. So March 27th and then April 3rd. Anything else for the good of the order? Mr. President? Yes. Uh, just I know uh, our friends from earlier have left, but I, as a uh, I'd like to wish everyone a happy Ramadan, Ramadan Mubarak, uh, to our many masjids in the city, and I appreciate their time today. Thank you. Uh, all the women Zimmerman. Do we know when we need to, uh, when the residents can submit the list for roads to get paved? I know we don't have public works here, but does anyone know off? Again, we'll get you that answer too. I'll get you find out tomorrow and, and text it out to where I'll get, I'll call uh, I'll go text the uh, yeah, Alderman that. Rodriguez to get it out to you. Yeah. Thank you. To you. Yeah. Yeah, yes. I'd like everyone to remember it's Irish Heritage Month too. Let us not forget that. Okay. Anything further? Here. Oh, Alder Sorry. Woman's Real quick, uh, Mr. Alsef is going to be the mayor for the day for the Irish. Congratulations, Mr. Alsef. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Don't get any ideas, Jack. Um, and and here, anything else for the order? No. Hearing none, all the Mendorso, is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion. motion to adjourn in a second. We are adjourned. Aye. Bye. Bye. Aye. Aye. Well, I got a regular Irish cap. Yeah, but we're, 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 we